What is up, everybody? Welcome back for another weekly Ask Me Anything with Joe Evers, defense expert. And I've also uh, invited on Caleb Roth with Stain and Seal Experts to help uh, break this news, you might say. <clears throat> Caleb, how are you? Man, Joe, I am doing great. I'm excited to be here. Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you made time for us. I really am. Uh, before we get into it, guys, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you guys probably saw my community announcement. If not, uh, we welcomed our latest, our newest Fence Fam member into my family. We uh, we brought my little daughter home. Actually, we brought her home yesterday. So as you can see, we're broadcasting live from my home studio, uh, which is better known as my daughter's bedroom. So uh, you'll see me live from here today uh, in possibly next week, too. We'll see how mom and uh, mom and the little ones settle in. Uh, also, guys, if you haven't signed up for the 10K giveaway, tonight is the tonight's like midnight. Tonight is the cutoff. So, uh, if you haven't signed up, jump in there, get signed up. Uh, if you haven't found the link for it, or if you need to find the link for it, we've actually got a whole video on this channel. Wait till the live broadcast is over, then click on that link, and it'll give you. Uh, I broke down the whole thing for you and gave you the link to sign up for it. So, the cutoff is uh, midnight tonight. And then we'll be making the announcement. We'll be drawing winners next week during the live broadcast on Thursday afternoon. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I brought in, I, I invited Caleb, and he was gracious enough to make some time for us to come in and uh, help me break the big news and then also answer any and all of your stain-related questions. Uh, Caleb, for those that probably like two people out there that don't know you, uh, why, don't you why don't you let everybody know who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name's Caleb Roth. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I own a company called Stain and Seal Experts. It's a service business. We do spits and deck staining here in the Middle Tennessee area, and we manufacture a national stain brand, um, Stain and Seal Experts Fence and Deck Stains. Yeah, that's right. So that's actually, Caleb, how you and I got to know each other uh, was uh, we, I own a fence company, and so we were looking into adding fence staining uh, into our, you know, our services. And I, I asked, I think I asked in one of the fence groups or, it, you know, Hey, who does stain? I'm getting into this. What do I need to know? You know, one of the guys just like tag stain and steel university, stain and steel experts university. He's like, you need to get into this face group, Facebook group now, and you need to meet these guys and get to know them. And, uh, man, I tell you what, you, you provide so much education for free, um, that I was just blown away. And then I tried the product a little bit. I learned more about it, you know, through you and through some other members and tried it out and haven't looked back since. Yeah, it's uh, that's the way it goes. We try to encourage people to get in the business and it's a lot of fun. So, well, you know, absolutely. It is. It absolutely is. It's it's one of those it's one of those things that's really worthwhile. It's really re rewarding when you're done with a project and you're looking back at the fence or the deck and uh, you can you can get a sense of accomplishment immediately uh, seeing the work that you've done. Yeah, they say it's not done till it's finished, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, so Caleb, you and I are going to break some news. Okay. So uh, let's just let's just do this. So I've created like a little background here, and guys, remember I'm a fence guy that's learning technology. So you know, bear with me a little bit here. Um, so Caleb and I were, were talking about the channel for a little bit and, and we kind of exchanged some ideas and, uh, guys, I am super, I'm super proud to announce that Stain and Steel Experts is our first channel sponsor. So wow. Stain and Steel Experts is going to be uh, sponsoring our live broadcasts. Uh, and Caleb, I can't say thank you enough. That means a lot to me. Well, Joe, we're excited to support what you're doing. We believe in it. So it makes sense. So, uh, what I'd like to do, Caleb, is maybe have you on, I don't know, once a month or something. Have you do kind of like what we're doing today, kind of a co-broadcast, because uh, I do get a lot of questions on the channel, whether it's here in the live or in the comments on recorded on the recorded video content about staining. Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge subject, and there's a fair amount of um, maybe maybe we'll call it inaccurate information out there in the marketplace. Sure. Um, and so I'd love to have you on just to try to try to clear some of those questions up well let's just uh let's get on it and, and we'll see how many people we can help in the process absolutely and, and caleb honestly that's one of the things that drew me to you is one all the free information you put out there you, you have a ton of recorded content uh but also you put on a live event this year there in nashville yeah well it wasn't that something i was really surprised we had such a big turnout 
it it was amazing. Um, how many people were there, Caleb? We had 75 companies and there were some companies were one person, some companies sent three or four people, um, yeah. people from Seattle, from Chicago, from Washington state, um, California, Texas, all the Southern states, all the Northern states, I think New York, you know, we had them from everywhere. Yeah, it was, I, I was there. It was really amazing to see just, just the wide variety of folks that were there. And to your point, how far a lot of them traveled to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and you put that, you put the training on for free. It's free. Yeah. It, that, that blew me away. It, yeah. Well, you know, it, it costs guys a lot of money to just to get there, just to get there and attend and uh, travel expenses and lodging costs money. So standing business was, was good to me and my family. So I just figured we'd try to help make it good for everybody else. Well, and you know what, Caleb, here's the thing that kind of, it kind of drew me to you. So I, I would, I would call us friends at this point. I mean, we were, we, I knew you through the business first, but then as I, as we chatted more, I'd like to, like to think I call you as one of my, one of my good friends. Right. Right. But that's what drew me to you is that I really feel like we have that similar giving spirit, right? That, that you're kind of in the same boat. I am that you want to see everyone succeed because a rising tide raises all the ships. Well, you're right. It does. Uh, it seems like the more people that sit down at the table, the bigger the table gets, it doesn't get smaller. So I like the idea of it. I, I have seen nothing but positive things happen by providing education, even in our own market here in Nashville, the standing market is, is gone. It's gone much better. And a lot of guys who were uh, in the business, they've learned things. We work together now, they make more money, um, you know, and it's, it's a good thing for everybody. Absolutely. I mean, the more educated, uh, can, you know, contractors, I, I, maybe educated is not the word, but more contractors that are kind of on the same skill level in the same market, the better. Yeah. Well, if you just have, it's, it's sort of a set of standard procedures, you know, the electrical business, uh, drywallers, painters, carpenters, they kind of all have standards that they go by. Um, and, and the staining industry just lacked that. It was, uh, every man for himself, really. So if we can kind of put together a set of not necessarily a standard by us, but a standard of this guy's doing this, he's doing that in different parts of the country, we bring all those ideas together and share them. And yeah. it just really helps. Well, I learned so much from those people. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and we're seeing this kind of in the fencing industry too. You know, there's, there's several guys out there, you know, Mr. Fence, Fence King, kind of those two guys come to mind. Uh, they're doing kind of similar things to yourself as, as in they're putting out as much educational content, you know, in the fencing world as possible. And we all kind of have that same thing in mind. Like if we can help everybody that helps the market and consequently that helps our customers. Well, what a lot of guys don't understand is that as, as you share your knowledge, it frees you to go get more knowledge. If you just hold on to five or six secrets uh, you're going to have five or six secrets forever. If you just keep giving them away, you're going to keep growing. And as you give away information, people give it back and you're going to learn things. And I've learned with all the free education that we do, people always say you do so much. And I'm thinking, man, you know, I learn probably I pick up more information from doing free training events than than you can you can imagine. I mean, it's really it's good for us, too. Yeah, that's you know, that's the thing is so in the medical community, you know, they have this training method wherein. You learn the method, you watch the method be done, you perform the method, but then the final step to learning this method is then you teach the method. Yeah. yeah. Because through teaching, you gain higher knowledge. You know, you can articulate what you're doing and why you're doing it and modify the method, mod modify your understanding of the method. Right. It makes you slow down and look at what you're doing. And then it makes you slow down and look at what the other person's doing and how can they be better. And, and then you then you use that to yourself. Well, and it brings a different perspective into it also. You know, you gain that additional perspective, that outside perspective that says, oh, I see what you're doing here, but what if you did it a little bit differently? Yeah. And it, it's that aha moment that you might not have gotten to if you only had your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's good. You know, when we spray fences, it seems like everybody sprays a fence a different way. They hold their wand differently. They, <laughs> they start and stop in different places. And uh, that's the way the entire business is. There's, there's little different ways of doing things to all achieve the same end results, some ways easier than others. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think when we're talking about staining fences, I think we've all seen the fence that uh, was stained in a less than professional manner, you know, whether it's not even, yeah, which is generally how, you know, right. There's splotchiness or stripes or, mm -hmm. you know, and that really gives, you know, the industry as a whole, a little bit of a black eye. 
Sure. Because then if someone sees that fence and then they're wanting their stained in their mind, they're thinking, well, I don't know if I do or not. Cause I don't want that. You know, right. I, that just doesn't look great. Whereas if they'd seen a really professional product out there in the marketplace, they go, yes, that is exactly what I want. You're right. You're right. And, and that goes also for the contractor. You know, a lot of contractors are not doing, uh, they're doing a disservice to their customers by not finishing the job, by not staining and sealing it because they used a product that was hard or they didn't know how to do something and they got a bad result. And so yeah. all of those things go hand in hand. Well, you know, and I think, I think part of it too is, you know, there's some, you know, there's some health concerns with some of the older products on the market, mm-hmm. you know, and ultimately that's what kept me out of the staining and sealing side for so long is just because there's those question marks that surrounded, you know, VOCs and putting my guys in direct contact with them, you know, day in and day out. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it's education on that too, to, that there are other alternatives in the marketplace uh, that are a bit safer to handle and deal with. Yeah. You know, I was blown away. We started doing we, a, a radio show similar to what you do. And, <laughs> and um, it really started out actually just me calling and interviewing people. I would, I would find out who the top stain guy was in a market and I would just call them up and try and just ask for help. Hey, what, what should I be doing? What do you do? Um, and, and over and over again, I was, I was hearing, uh, diminished lung capacity, uh, different cancers, pancreas cancer, uh, kidney cancer, brain cancer, things like that. And it just scared me to death. And, and the, the common thread was high VOC, even they call them low VOC, but they're, they're a higher VOC content than we really like to see. Yeah. And that's what's on the shelf today. And you go get it. If it's got a smell to it. That's what you're breathing. And so yep. that kind of, since you went down that path, that's, that's what we did. We, we decided, Hey, we got to make something that's, that's safer to use, less harmful. Absolutely. That's a great segue, Caleb. What I want to do real quick before we go down that road, because I want to spend some time talking about your story. Uh, let's let's say hi to a few folks real quick. Let's do it. We've got Rich Bentley here all the way from Ohio. Oh. Welcome, Rich. We've got Sergeant Bulldogs here from Washington State. All right. So the Northwest, Ohio. Would you call Ohio Midwest? I'd say so, right? I wouldn't call it that, but I, oh. uh, they, they may. I would call it just... Uh, I don't know. It's sort of halfway between the East and the Midwest, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're we're kind of building our geography here. One thing, Caleb, that I love to do when we're doing this is kind of see how far reaching you know this channel can be, these broadcasts can be. One, uh, gosh, what was this? Two or three, two or three broadcasts ago, two or three weeks ago, we had basically you know the four corners of the United States and kind of all. We had a gentleman from Canada that popped in that said hello, uh, yeah. and one of the first live broadcasters actually a gentleman from London that popped in and said hey. So yeah, we're a little late. We're a little late for them. It's about nine o'clock, but maybe somebody's yeah. watching. Well, and so that's why. So guys, we also do so. <laughs> This week was an exception, but typically the last Tuesday of every month, I do another live broadcast in the morning ah. uh, just to try to t- try to help those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Now, my, my newest Fence Fam edition showed up, uh, when was that? Monday morning. It, it was it, Sunday night, Monday morning. So my Tuesday was a bit uh, hectic. I wasn't able to do that. But yeah, we try to do that to, to, to bring in the guys from across the pond. Yeah, they're, I, I really enjoy their perspective. Things are different there. They, they really are. And it's, it's a neat perspective to see Mm -hmm. Dan Hardy. What is up? Caleb, have you met Dan? Dan has used our stain on his fence at his house. I love that. I love that. Dan is such a good guy. Uh, yeah, he and I actually serve on the uh, Midwest chapter of the, uh, American Fence Association. I heard heard you were there and and we would like to be there too, but yeah, uh, absolutely. We'll come. It's a good time. It's, uh, you know, and, and I talked about this even before I was I was involved as I am now in the AFA. It's such a great organization for guys to get involved with, you know, if nothing else, just from, again, in the educational standpoint, the networking. Uh, yeah. You, the next time we have a, uh, and now, now that we're kind of in pandemic times, it's a little bit less uh, interactive. We have less uh, in-person events, but next in-person event, you should come. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was pretty bummed out that Fence Tech got canceled. You and me both. I yeah. was so excited. You know, I we got Tony on and he and I chatted about it. He was so passionate about it and so fired up. So when I saw that announcement, I was like, oh, I can't imagine what Tony's going through. Yeah, man, when, when you take your whole team there and you see these guys that are doing that, they, you know, a lot of guys in our industry, they feel like they're in a bubble. 
Like they're a fence person and there's nobody else. When you go to that event and you go, wow, there's a, there's a whole fence world. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's good. You know, you yeah. realize you're not alone. you got a support structure around you. So it's good. Exactly. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I talk about that a little bit from time to time where, you know, we all think that we've got it so much different than everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what you find, especially at events like that is to your point is you're sharing some of the same struggle, right. no matter where yeah. you are. And, yeah. and I said, you know, if you want to see this in person, here's what you do. You go to fence tech and just walk down the middle of the aisle and say out loud to yourself, well, you know what? Everyone else ha here has it really good. Cause I deal with rocks. And you will that you will have a group of fifty to one hundred guys around you that's like, oh yeah, you think you've got rocks? I've got rocks. And the next guy is like, no, 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 no. I have shelf rock, which is way worse than the blue rock that you guys have. And and you find out pretty pretty quickly that uh, a lot of guys deal with rock. <laughs> oh yeah, you got rock. You got cheap competition. You got all these things. Everybody, the every market, you know in the world, you know, Beverly Hills, there's a guy going, oh, there's just too cheap here. And I'm going, oh man, come on. <laughs> no, or, or so it's so hard to find help. Like I, guys, you won't understand. I just can't find help anywhere. Yeah. That is a nationwide problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure it is. All right, let's keep, continue on. Joseph Ginter. Hello. You think that's Ginter, Caleb, or Ginter? I would say Ginter. All right. Joseph, hello, regardless. From Kansas. So uh, I'm here in southwest Missouri, so you're our neighbor to the northwest or neighbor to the west a little bit. Welcome. Sergeant Bulldog, thank you. I appreciate the congratulations. I'm yeah. still, still a little bit in the uh, sleep deprivation mode, so congratulations. I definitely appreciate it, but we'll, def we'll get closer to the finish line as uh, we start getting sleep again. <laughs> Rich Bentley. So Rich Bentley's from Ohio. So he's been on the repair side of the fence industry. I do get a lot of stain and paint questions and I have to respond with, I don't know. Um, I think that's common. Yeah. Right, you know, but I think there, that's common. I think it is. And I think there's a Facebook group that we could join. Yeah. Yeah. So seriously, Rich, um, search for stainless steel experts. Uh, they've got a, a free Facebook group. I tell you what, so Caleb, if any one of your team are watching, they should drop it in the comments below a link to the Facebook. Yeah. It, um, it, if, if you, the fastest way is to search staining university on Facebook. It's, a, it's a group. Just click in there. It, we run a clean, clean family friendly place. So you don't have to worry about uh, getting smacked with a twisted tea bottle. If you ask a question, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> We welcome everyone, and, and we're glad to have folks in there. I love the uh, I love the reference there. Yeah, the memes have begun. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? so Caleb, the one thing that I really like about your Facebook group too is that uh, it's it's open for everyone, and mm -hmm. including you know people to talk about all all topics, right? To yeah. include other products. Well, that, that's the staining industry. You know, we would be silly if we if we excluded products. It would. Uh, um, why would we put the blinders on? I, I agree, Caleb. I really do. Um, I, but unfortunately, it's that's unique. You know, mm -hmm. it, there's some other groups out there, not necessarily staining, but there's other groups out there that are very much uh, one manufacturer driven. You know, where you get that perspective. If you try to bring up a different perspective, it gets shut down. And, and, you know, and we try not to spam guys to death and, and we don't spam them. You'll notice I, we don't post a lot of information about our own company. It's it's more it's more sharing of information. But as a manufacturer, I think we would be silly to not look at what the rest of the industry is doing and say, oh, that's a good idea. We should do that. Or, oh, they're having trouble with this. We should look out for that. You know, I sure. think it's smart to keep an eye and your finger on the pulse of the industry. So, you know what direction it's going in. That's it. You know, and it's, it is funny, Caleb, because sometimes like I have to pull you into the comments. I'm like, I had to tag you like, Caleb, come and talk to them about this. You know, yeah. just because you're so hands off, which is great. You know, yeah. it, it gives guys a well-rounded perspective of the industry as a whole. Yeah. Well, I like to see what other people, cause you know, I've got an answer for everything. Sure. Cause the way I would do it, but the way I do it is, is generally the way I would do it. And so I like to see what, what everybody else would do. Absolutely. So Rich, as you're watching this, if you've got questions, we'd love to, we'd love to help you. I mean, that's why we're here. Uh, we're here till five 30 central. So we've got plenty of time to answer any and all of your staining questions uh, as well as jump over that Facebook group. It's completely free. It's uh, full of great guys that are and gals that are out there trying to help everyone succeed. Yeah. 
Oh, here we go. There's your link. Just click on the link and head right over. Yeah, so that, that link's wrong, though. It should be oh. facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash standing university unless something has changed. So. Oh, okay. Well, oh, Miss, Miss Ross, if you'll fix that for us, that'd be great. <laughs> you got it. Sean's in the house. What is up, Mr. Fence? Look at him there. He, Sean was one of the guys I was, I was probably looking forward to meeting. You know, one of the top guys I was looking forward to meeting. Uh, I, was, I wanted to see his booth at Fence Tech this year. I was going to see if it was taller this year. <laughs> I loved his booth last year. I didn't see. I didn't go. I didn't go this year. And I didn't uh, go to 2020. Yeah, the booth. I've seen videos and like I, yeah. I have regretted not going. Like basically every day since Fence Tech. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, it, yeah. it was the last of the free world, wasn't it? Because it was like. Yeah. As we were flying home from Finstech, the COVID thing was was kind of getting. You were kind of starting to get a little concerned about it, yes. and, and uh, here we are now. Well, the reason I didn't go is I had a conflict. So each year we go to a conference called uh, Social Media Marketing World, where uh, basically it's guys that get together and learn more about social media marketing, uh, and it's in California. And so I went to it, and if you as you'll remember, California is one of the first states to start statewide mm-hmm. lockdown. And that conversation was going on the day before we were headed home. And so yeah. I was uh, I was praying that we could get to the airport and get on a plane before they decided to shut the state down. Yeah, I'd hate for you to have to smuggle yourself, get get across the border that way. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, yeah. here's the thing. It's like we, we both know people from California, great people, but it's a great place to visit. You know, I, I think California is probably the most beautiful. Northern California is probably the most beautiful and perfect temperature 70 degrees in the day, 60 degrees at night is born. I love it there. Yeah. You know, I the people I met there were not what I expected. They were, uh, they had lots of beliefs that were, were not what the rest of the world has been told about California. You know, there are a lot of good people yeah. there. That's one of the things that I've been surprised to find as well mm-hmm. is, uh, yeah, as, as you talk to people from there, yeah, they, they disagree uh, with a lot of the uh, stereotypes, you know, yeah. that revolve around California. But anyway, but Sean, hello. Surface Therapy says, hello, Caleb and Joe from Wichita. Yep. Chad Johnson, fantastic company in, in uh, Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. And, uh, that's our uh, that's our third. Are they Kansanites? What do you call them? Kansans? Third, uh, third folks in Kansas. Yeah, I don't know what they call them in Kansas. <laughs> right. So Rich says, the most... The most asked question I get, is it worth staining an older fence? And if so, what stain to use? It's worth it. You know, I, I, I would say it's worth it to a point. If the fence is, is sturdy and structurally sound, then yeah, you can you can take a pretty bad fence and, and restore it. And you can do it a lot cheaper than you can build a new fence. And you can really add some some beauty and longevity to it. Absolutely. What stain to use is, is going to depend. I'm always going to put you to an oil-based penetrating stain first. Yep. Uh, second choice is if you've just got something that's terribly ugly, mix match boards, uh, new and old, uh, you may want to go with a water-based solid. Just, just depends. Got to make that call. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I agree. Um, you can, you can add years of life to a fence just by staying and sealing it because, you know, as a fencing contractor, some of the fences we see get replaced are just because they're unsightly. Yeah. Not that they're structurally unsound, not that, you know, they're going to fall over on the family pet. It's that they just don't look nice. And, you know, someone bought a new house, a beautiful house, but the house, the fence around it isn't beautiful. So they want to make it look new again, uh, where for a fraction of the cost, you could clean that up, you know, clean it with a nice algicide, make sure you kill everything on the fence first and then allow it to dry and then use a, a and again, oil based product over it, uh, you know, well, we we've had we've had really good success using the darker oil based colors on old fence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, specifically, we like walnut. Uh, yeah. We like the San Silex versus walnut. Uh, it does a really good job of blending in new to old. You know, so if we have a fence we, where we replaced one line of it, so you've got one new line of fence, but the rest of it's uh, existing. The walnut does a really nice job of blending those two. It does. You know, there's this, I was in Dallas and I stopped by this place called the Gas Monkey Garage, I believe. You ever heard oh, of that? Oh, yeah. TV yeah. Show? And what they do there, if they get a really super old car, you know, a lot of times they'll go buy old cars and they won't fully restore it. They will, um, 
they'll fix the motor up, you know, they'll, they'll maybe they'll rebuild the engine or just get it, get it tuned up, give it a buff and, and, and wax, put a set of tires on it. And the, the one thing that they'll do with old leather is they'll take leather. I've seen them take leather from like a 1915 model car and they've got a guy that'll come out there and he'll clean it and condition that leather. And it'll be, it'll look like the desert. It'll be cracked and, and terrible. And when he gets done conditioning that, it'll look like new leather. Yep. And that's kind of the same thing with, with the wood. If you can put that oil in it, same thing with cedar shakes. You see cedar shakes and they, they start yep. to curl and cup. If you oil those things, man, they'll lay back down flat and they'll look really nice. So it's yeah. definitely, definitely worth uh, adding an oil to, a, to an old fence. Well, and, and Caleb, that's what I talk about when we're talking about, you know, when we did a video on oil versus water base, and that question comes up pretty often. And the, and I, I use something similar, but I use a, I use an example of my work boots. Yeah. Right. So if my work boots are, are looking a little worn or looking a little worse for wear, uh, I don't, I don't clean them while, well, you know, I don't uh, moisturize them with a, a water base, uh, anything, yeah. you always moisturize them and seal them with an oil base, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever product that you choose to put on it, um, you know, mink oil or whatever, it's always oil, right? Because it moisturizes. It's a natural product. Back look. Yeah. And oil naturally repels water. Mm -hmm. Water does not naturally repel water. And so that's usually uh, it's usually the example I give, but I like the example on the on refinishing uh, leather interiors too. But yeah, but so, but so Rich, that's uh, it's kind of kind of our answer to your question. Yeah, that's it. What is up, Mandy? Oh, she's watching. Welcome and happy New Year. So Mandy's right there in in your neck of the woods. Yep, yep. Mandy is a fantastic team member of ours. We're so proud to have her. She does a fantastic job. You name it, she does it. So <laughs> she is a stain and seal expert. That phone rings and people ask technical questions because we get technical questions all day, every day. And and I'll hear hear the conversation. And just before I open my mouth to give the answer, she spits the uh, probably a better answer than I've got to give out. So that's great. So, uh, we have a great technical department. You can call Mandy anytime. I like that. Kelly Richardson, what yep. is up to you? Hey. Welcome. All right. Then Ashley dropped in the groups. So facebook.com forward slash groups, then Sydney University. Head on over there. There it is. She does a great job. Ashley is everywhere. Like it seems like she's everywhere at all times. Yeah, she was here a few minutes ago and now she's she's left. She's gone home and now she's on the computer again. So <laughs> I love it. All right. So Kelly, great question. <laughs> if you had asked this question two weeks ago, uh, the answer would have been February 2021 in Nashville. Uh, but now the answer is 2022 in New Orleans. Uh, and, I, you know, we ought to, I ought to reach out to Tony and see, see if he'd like to do another interview to, to hear more of kind of the reasoning behind it. But if I were to guess, so, well, so while we were there you're at the St. Seal Experts training, uh, we went into Nashville and uh, when you talk to the folks that live there, um, they're all pretty much of the same mind that uh, the city government has been really harsh on uh, on just it's how it allows its people to you know conduct their business in general. Um, so I would I would almost guess that that it is something along those lines. Uh, is yeah, I know we have a mayor here in Nashville, and he is uh, uh, he has a great reputation. <laughs> we were. <laughs> He, you know, a lot of people of uh, they've been really hard on a lot of businesses. They've hurt a lot of businesses with these, with some of these rules, and um, and it doesn't matter really what side you're on. At the end of the day, it, it it has hurt a lot of businesses. So the sooner we can get things back up and going, the better, because we'd yep. really we'd like to see our city excel. You know, in all things. So. Yeah, I mean, this event would have been great. You know, it would have been great for the city uh, just because it would have brought people in from all over the country and probably some international. You know, there'd probably be some guys coming out from Canada and, and just from all walks of life into the city. And uh, we were talking about this last week in the live. And I was like, you know, when when I talked to Tony and heard how passionate he was about having this event. I mean, I think his, him and his team flew out there like three times to meet yeah. with the city, to meet with the venue, to make sure everything was being handled correctly, to make sure they were on top of whatever the current you know procedures were. You know, knowing Tony, if he had to have it like out in the parking lot, he would have, you know, 
you know, opposed, you know, I'm not opposed to having it outdoors, you know. No, I, I've seen you do it. <laughs> do it in Florida and in, in, in February and we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I, anyway, so to Kelly, to answer your question, the next FizTech is going to be uh, February 2022 in New Orleans, hopefully. Yeah. You know, speaking of events, there's no fence tech this year. They might have to be a staining university. We may have to throw an extra one in. There you go. You know, I, I, I'm up for that, Caleb. You know I am. I would love to come back out there because, one, one I learned a lot, which that's obviously, you know, primary objective. What I found a lot with, you know, whether it was your training or trainings I go to elsewhere is, you know, you almost find equal value outside of the actual training itself. Yeah, just meeting new guys and gals and talking about just talking about the industry and learning new stuff. So I, yeah, I would look forward to that immensely. Well, if we can, if we can get, you know, we we rely heavily on experts from around the country to come help us with that training. So yeah. we may uh, put our our Batman light up in the sky and see if we can. <laughs> if everybody can do it early in the year, we'll do it this year. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be an incredible idea. All right, Charlie E. Hello, how's it going? I wonder where Charlie's from. Yeah, Charlie, where are you from? I like the picture of your puppy there. Uh, we know this guy, Kenny. There, there's one of the top instructors we had at the class. Wouldn't be possible yeah. without him. Yeah, so much. Kenny changed our whole game on spraying fences. We got a whole new wand that we use now and tips. And I thought I was living in the space age, but I found out I was in the stone age when I met Kenny. <laughs> Just watching him stain a fence is, <laughs> I mean, part of me wanted to learn, then part of me just wanted to wanted to watch him. Yeah, yeah just watch him do it. <laughs> he, uh, man, I tell you what, that guy's incredibly good. Welcome, Kenny. All right. Oh, okay. So, look, sounds like Kelly's in your neck of the woods, Caleb. Nashville. Yeah, Kelly is, uh, he's just north of Nashville. He's a great stain and, and power wash contractor. Oh, and he, came, he said he came out of hibernation the other day. I saw he posted on the internet. And <laughs> so hope he didn't get, hope he didn't freeze to death. I know it's pretty nasty today in Nashville. Yeah. Oh, is it? Is it pretty cold? Yeah. Yeah. It just rained all night. It started. Uh, I got up about four o'clock this morning, went outside and it was pouring rain. Oh, and, uh, and uh, the guy I go to the gym with, he said it started at 10 o'clock. So it's been raining all night and all day. Yeah, so we watched it. So we we brought our daughter home yesterday. So as we were like doing the discharge stuff and all that, we watched it. Sw we switch from rain to snow, and uh, it snowed all the way home. We actually there's a couple cars uh, in the ditches on the way home. So I got a question: Did you drive an Ozark fence truck to the hospital? <laughs> I did not. Uh, <laughs> so my wife's uh, SUV is not wrapped. Uh, she she has made it very clear uh, that she will not be driving an orange vehicle. Um, she's not one for she's not one for excess attention. Well, you, you could know. do a pink one, a pink Ozark fence vehicle. <laughs> you know what? Not a bad idea. You know what? I should probably do. I should probably just do it and then just like surprise her with it. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, it's very thoughtful. <laughs> Rich says, thank you very much. I'll do research. I might be able to add that to what I offer my customers. Rich, I would encourage it. I really would. Uh, Ask Rich, Rich, if you can hear us, where do you live? What what city, what state, what market are you in? We, we may have somebody already there and you may be able to subcontract it. Or yeah. um, or obviously you could we could help you get going, do it yourself. But uh, that's a resource that we offer is, is we've got, con there's 2,000 guys in our, our group. Why don't we just find one of those guys that's already crushing it in the stain business and have him do your jobs for you? That's a great way to add that service, figure out if you want to do it or not. Well, and, you know, one thing I found is most everyone in the group is is kind of our of our similar mind. And then I bet if there was someone in the group that was in your market, they would they would tell they would teach you what you need to know. Right. If I remember Rich is in Ohio, isn't he? The the mid he yeah. the middle the middle eastern western part of the country. <laughs> yeah. So we do have guys in Ohio. Quite a few, actually. So, yeah. um, I'm trying to remember the name of the markets. I think there's there's Cincinnati. There's guys. We've got guys in Cleveland, um, and there's another city. What's another big city there in Ohio? I can't remember. We got three or four guys around one city. I don't think it's Cleveland. I think it's uh, starts Dayton. Maybe, maybe it's Dayton. Yeah, Dayton's another good one. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, yeah, so Rich, let us know where you're from. We could probably, I say we, Caleb could probably connect you with uh, some guys there in your market. As as a fence company owner, I couldn't recommend it enough. You know, I'm at, at this at this point, I wish we had started sooner offering it as a service. Uh, just because it offers another level of service to our existing customers. Mm-hmm. Right? So we've we've kind of taken it one step further. What we were doing is offering, you know, once we install the fence, we could come back out and stain and seal it. Also, we reached out to our previous customers and said, hey, you know, if, you, if your fence is looking a little old, but it's still structurally sound, we'd love to make it beautiful again. And so we would go back out, you know, uh, and stain and seal the fences. But one thing we're starting to do is, uh, and we're going to do a video on this later, is we're going to start pre-staining our own fence boards, uh, cedar boards specifically. Yeah. Um, I am super excited about that. So from a company perspective, I you you absolutely would do yourself a service by looking into it, for sure. Well, you know, in, in the fence business, I grew up in the fence business just like you did. And what I saw maybe 10 years ago, I started seeing it. And now it's commonplace is these, these warranties. Warranties for a fence is much different than it was 15 yeah. years ago. Guy, I mean, and I, I think it's, it's, it's good for the industry. It's helped the industry. But at the same time, there a lot of, a lot of guys just said, you know, we've been in business for a year. We'll just put a 10 year warranty on our wood fences. And you know, that's tough. That's hard to, to, to really do that. Right. It's hard to do that. When you stain and seal the fence, particularly with oil based stuff, you, you can feel a lot better. You sleep better, a lot better at night, knowing that you maybe you put an extended warranty on your, on your fence jobs. Yeah. Oh, you, you've got some kind of a leg to stand on there because the, the stain will definitely help it prevent warping, things like that. Keep it looking. Good. And, and Rich, if you put, if you put signs on your work, it also, it also helps your brand out. Oh right? yeah. So yeah. when we put our, you know, Ozark fence sign on a freshly stained fence, uh, it makes our brand look that much better. Oh yeah. So this, so actually guys, so the background uh, that we put up here, I actually just uh, took a picture from St. Selects, which is actually a fence that they had stained. Uh, but right in the upper right hand corner, just out of the screen is one of their signs. Uh, and okay. it, it absolutely makes it stand out. And I, look, rec- I recognize that fence. Yeah. I, so it was funny. I was looking for, I was looking for stained fences to use in this background and boom, I Googled it and boom up. You guys popped. I was like, <laughs> you, know, I you, see, there. you see right over my head, the green. Yeah. I'll tell you a story about this fence. Okay. So this fence was, I stained this one several years ago, I think three or four years ago. And this was when I was still staining fences. I wasn't doing all the work, but I was still on every job. And it was a deal for a home builder. And he said, look, the fence is going in tomorrow. We close the next day. You've got to stain it the same day we, or the day after we build it. And it's treated pine. You can see the green. Yeah. I said, I, uh, no warranty, but okay. And he said, I don't care. He said, you just, it's got to be stained. We did a fence in a deck and we, we stained that fence. It was, it was very wet. That's our pecan color. Yeah. And now it's, I think right around December or January this year is four years. Okay. The fence still looks good. Yeah. It still looks good. And it was a soaking wet fence. So, um, oil based stains may surprise you, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Uh, the oil bait, like once, and understand, guys, like once you start, once you start getting into stainless steel and, and looking for more education, it's going down a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> you will, you will come up for air like three or four weeks later and wonder where, where, where your time went. Um, but the more you read on just oil based stains in general, uh, the more you, the more you just sell yourself on it. Yeah. You know, in terms of the benefits, in terms of the limited drawbacks. Um, but yeah, but anyway, so the, we love it because when we put our sign on it, though, it makes our sign pop too. Oh man, it looks so good. It pops. It really, that's a treated pine fence there and that color is called pecan. But if you, you put it on a new cedar fence, it's unbelievable. Yeah. If you hadn't have told me that, I would have probably swore that was a Western red cedar fence. Yeah, see, see the green over, my, I don't know if it's over my head or your head. It or your, is. It is. And I, if you hadn't told me that, I would have never seen that. But yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's, that was a brand, brand new fence. I cringed when we stained it, but now every time I drive by it, my heart just beats out of my chest and I'm proud, you know, <laughs> yeah, I beat absolutely. My chest when I go by because what, what kind of other product, you know, we tell everybody 13% moisture, but yeah. being a contractor, you got to have flexibilities. And uh, the fact that we were able to do that and get away with it is it's, it's a huge thing. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and it keeps your brand, you know, looking, looking great for that long too. You know, if, if we went and built a fence today, it would not look as good four years from now, no matter what, no matter how well it's built, just because UV damage on the boards turns them gray. You know, they, they lose that luster, uh, but staining and sealing them obviously prolongs that. Yep. Yeah. Mandy's still watching. She's seen that fence. I drove her by it. That's the fence I took you to see that, that we stained wet. This is a fresh picture of it. So very good. Yep. All right. So Charlie is joining us from Sunrise Beach, Missouri. What is up, Char fellow Missourian? I love it. I love it. Where is Sunrise Beach? There's no beaches in Missouri, is there? Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer. So it, it is a artificially created uh, beach. But yeah, it, uh, well, yeah, it, it's man made. And, and beach, it, we call them beaches even if they're on a lake. Yeah, we got a beach here too. Yeah, if, if they've got sand and it's waterfront, we're going to call it a beach. Well, yeah. Just because we would rather be on a beach. What is up, Jack? Jack Clevenger had a good time in Nashville. Was looking forward to coming back in February. New Orleans it is. Yeah, Jack, if I'm not mistaken, Jack is up in I, – I don't think it's Seattle, but I think he's pretty darn close to Seattle. Kind of Pacific Northwest? Pacific Northwest. Jack, I think, is going to be a stain dealer for us up there. So we're nice. really excited about that. That's a great market. Yeah, congratulations, Jack. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Kelly said it was great outside yesterday. It sure was. It sure was. What's your temperature up there, Joe? Because it was uh, maybe – Kelly, what was it, 60 degrees, 70 degrees yesterday? No, it, it's been 30s and 40s here lately. Uh, today, I mean, there's still – you know, if I look out the window, there's still snow on the ground. It's, I think when I was driving around earlier, it was 33, 34 degrees. So, yeah, yeah we, we don't have, we don't have the uh, nice weather like you guys do over in Nashville. We, uh, well, you know, we'll have a nice storm tonight. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's funny when you watch, when you watch the weather, it really, it comes, it comes through kind of Southwest Missouri first and then it heads straight over to you guys. There's two places I watch. I watch Dallas. Yeah. And, and then, I watch Missouri, and I can pretty much have my 24-hour heads-up notice on weather here in Nashville. Sure. This is a good question. So Service Therapy asks, are you planning any roundtables anywhere for 2021, like what you're going to do in Dallas before it got canceled? You know, I'm so tired of things getting canceled, but absolutely. I'd love to do – maybe we just need to do a virtual one. I want to do yeah. – so So the roundtable he's talking about – in the, um, we, we need to do two. We need to do one for the industry as a whole, for just sure. everybody. But also in the in the um, in the fencing business, you see a lot more companies that are scaled to size. In sure. the fencing business, it's generally a one man show. And sometimes you see guys with maybe a crew or two crews. When you get into companies that have, you know, like like the deck medic who has fifteen locations, they're the only one yeah. doing that. So what we wanted to do with that round table was people who really wanted to scale. And, and I don't know if we would, we discussed even making an invite peer invite only. So Joe, if you okay. came, you would have, if you'd have to be invited by somebody who said, yeah, this person's legit and yeah. uh, they're serious. And, uh, but we've, we've talked about doing that. I think it would help the industry. I really do. I agree. I like, Caleb, I like that idea a lot because you're right in that, in that you, the general scale you see in the sanding and ceiling side is a guy with a few, with a few helpers. Mm -hmm. That's, I think the most common. Um, but that question comes up a lot in your group on, Hey, I'm wanting to add a crew. Uh, what, what should I do? Or you know, the scaling type questions, you know, when should I hire more guys? Uh, the big one I get is how do I go from the, from the field to the office? Yeah. And the answer is, you don't, you got to transition. <laughs> yeah. 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 You don't wake up one day and be like, all right, well, it's Monday morning from now on. I'm in the office. Yeah. That office is called a truck. Yeah. A Ford or a Chevy or a Dodge. You know, that's that's what I did. That's how I got out of the field. I spent, I would go to the job site, get them started. You know, if you got any questions, I'll be right in the truck. I would make phone calls from the truck. I would run across town, look at another thing, come back, get out if I needed to. And, and that's how I did it. And at first I felt really guilty because I wasn't doing the manual physical work, but I was sure. still working. And uh, I think that's the story a lot of guys need to hear to, to say, hey, to get from from crew, crew leader, foreman type of uh, owner operator to to scaling it, you're going to have to make a transition, and, and you can do that through the seat of your truck. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a great transition. And, you know, so a lot of industries would call it like a field supervisor. Mm-hmm. Right? So you'd go from crew chief or foreman to a field supervisor where you're around, you know, you're, you're managing two crews, three crews, maybe where you're just kind of, you're on roller skates all over town. Just yep. kind of bumping for that. And, and most guys, they got to answer the phone calls. They got to pay the bills. They got to estimate jobs and do all that. You can do all that from your truck. Absolutely. So, Caleb, that brings up a nice question in that. So in, in the fencing, in the fencing world, you really need a physical location, whether you're, you know, storing your materials or your hat, you're building out, you know, displays for customers to come and see. Uh, maybe you're doing some fabricating, that sort of thing. In staining and sealing, I really I really don't know that a physical location is is mandatory for a service provider. Um, you know, I, I guess within the world of box trucks and box trailers, yeah, you're right. But you know, funny thing is, it's it's there's all shades to this thing. I've got a friend here in Nashville. He does about three million a year in fencing, and he doesn't have a location. He doesn't have one stick of top rail or one fence picket in his backyard. All subcontractors, all of his employees have their own vehicles that they take home, and he he works in his living room, and uh, he does a fan. I mean, he does a great business, and it's a it's a superb business that he runs. So. That's interesting. Yeah. And I guess you guys, I mean, you guys are obviously a large market to where you guys have suppliers there mm-hmm. in town that, that can store the inventory. And we're getting now, you know, in, like in in Dallas, one thing I noticed, I'm sure there's a lot of guys that hold a lot of material in Dallas, but I was amazed when I went to the several times that I go to Dallas a year that I see nobody holds a lot of material. A lot of guys are going every day and picking it up. Nashville has gotten to where there's you still got your lines at the supply houses, but everything they're, they're running material drops. And for me, yeah. I've, it, as a, as, as a, being a fence company owner, I, I think it's worth every penny to have material dropped off the day before, because it's how long does it take to sit at the supply house? Yeah. If, no. if you don't have a yard, get it delivered. I agree. I agree. You know, the one, and, and only because we're a smaller market, I think that's probably, I, that's my perspective. That's yeah. where my perspective is coming from in that all the supply houses are three hours away. Yeah. Whether it's Kansas yeah. City, St. Louis, Tulsa, yeah. you know, they're all three hours. And so, you know, and they make weekly deliveries. You know, they're, they're in, you know, Master Halco delivered today. They deliver on Thursdays. They're probably uh, going to make 10 drops for you in a day, though. They're going to bring no. it to one location. They're bringing it to your lot. Yeah. And, or your or your backyard, you know, no matter, it's going to one place. Uh, but there's also significant pricing differences when you're talking about, you know, if I were to order a bundle, one bundle of pickets or two bundles of pickets versus a truckload, which is 32 bundles, maybe 30 bundles, maybe. Um, so that's, that's usually why I, I'm an advocate for having a yard of some well, sort. You, 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 yeah, you save money, but you got to take care of inventory loss, and you got to pay the you got to pay the rent. You know, that's right. You got, there is a cost associated. There absolutely is. You know, you, you it's absolutely just, worth it though. It's absolutely you, you, worth it. you end up moving that cost just to overhead from yeah. your materials into your overhead. Um, but but yeah, so it, but in the staining and sealing, you know, I I think I think that's a great you know progression from. You know, a guy that's got two or three, two or three helpers that he stains the fence, and he's got guys that help him train one of those guys up, where they can be the lead, and then uh, you step into more of like a f- field supervisor role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's great. Well, look at that, sixty-eight degrees. Oh yeah, that's unbelievable. All right, so this question has come up a couple times. Did you wear orange to the hospital? Uh, to the hospital, yes. But when we got changed into, <laughs> I'd actually asked this question previously is, you know, so every you, you have to wear blue um, surgical scrubs or whatever to go into the surgical suite. And so I was like, you know, could I bring my own? I, I knew you were going to have orange scrubs. On. <laughs> I, I asked. I was like, because I knew it would make, it would, it would be good for content. Right. And, and I really wanted a picture of me holding my newborn in orange scrubs. I think that would be hilarious. Uh, it, it was a pretty firm no. <laughs> it was uh, – they they didn't have the sense of humor that I thought they might around it. Because I was like, well, let's see. The whole thing is like I wear orange everywhere. And, uh, and it was basically if you do not wear the scrubs that we provide, you do not have to participate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. I will wear blue scrubs. That sounds good. Uh, oh, well. So, 
This is in reference to me wrapping uh, Taylor's vehicle in pink. Um, Tim, 10 out of 10 do not recommend that kind of surprise. Huh. It's interesting. Well, well, there's two of us, Joe, and I'd, I'd say that makes it 8 out of 10. <laughs> well, but here's the thing. Then maybe yeah. you agreed with her. So maybe um, – Maybe we'll give this consideration. Maybe I won't just do it. Maybe I'll just give it consideration. They may be well, afraid they can't, can't stand the overwhelming joy that they'll have. When, when they <laughs> well, here's what I'm really good at. Like, I think guys are good in general, just dropping subtle hints and then just like gauging the interest. I'll just do that. I'll be like, hey, you know what I saw the other day is I saw a pink SUV rolling around town. I thought that looked amazing. Mary you Kay. Know, oh, yeah. yeah, it'll be fun. And like it'll be great for breast cancer awareness month. You know, we we've got so I mean our company colors are orange, but typically we bring in uh, pink hats and pink shirts for breast cancer awareness month. So it could be like fitting in with that. You got to support your community. That's right. Any stain and fence maintenance recommendations for a pine shadow box fence? Yeah, sure. I'll take that one. Um, I, I don't know what the context is, if it's been stained before, if it's new or if it's old, but but generally uh, a shadow box is the it's the worst. It's the toughest. It's the most dreaded fence to stain. And I'm sure you're thinking that's your luck, Martin, but that's the way it is. A shadow box fence uses a lot of stain, and um, but you need to put a lot of stain on it because if you don't, you're going to be doing it every couple of years. So I would, I would recommend um, go ahead and put a flood coat of an oil-based stain on it. Clean it first if necessary, and then a couple years later, come back and check it out and see if it needs a needs a little light maintenance coat. Yeah, shit, you're you're exactly right, Kale. On the on the shadow box, it always takes twice as long than you think it's going to, and it takes twice as much material. Yeah, it's it's about twice as much material and about three to four times as much labor, uh, <laughs> yeah. net hours wise. Um, we've got a great video on on it. A shadow box fence, actually, if you if you if you go at 100 square foot a gallon and you cover all surfaces, we we measured it to a to a T. Uh, you need two gallons of stain per eight foot section, and you need to okay. the math. If you just called it a solid fence, would be 50 square foot a gallon. That's how you sh if if you're putting 100 100 square foot, 125 square foot a gallon of stain on a privacy fence to match that saturation level, it's you got to go 50 square foot a gallon with your math. Um, and that's the problem most people must make. The mistake most people make with a shadow box is they don't put enough stain on it. They go to Home Depot and you say, I got 200 foot of shadow box fence. They give you 10 gallons or 15 gallons of stain. You put it on and a year later you hate it because first of all, when you started, it looks too thin and, yeah. and a year later it's faded out. So that's how we, we used to get a lot of neighborhood HOAs that had shadow box fences that required a certain, maybe a cedar tone stain because we'd put more stain on than anybody else and it looked better than all the rest and we get all the rest of the jobs. So that's yeah. different. you know, and that's one of the benefits that we're going to see when we're going, well, we, we already see it. We already pre-stain, but we're going to a dip method on pre-stain. That's one of the benefits of pre-staining it though, is that when we're talking about pre-staining it, shadow box is just like privacy. As far as yeah. the thing goes, it gets dipped, okay. it gets dry, dried and then it gets sent out. I would certainly pre-stain all my shadow box fences if I could. So, uh, Gail, that brings up a good question. When we're talking about treated pine, you know, probably the most common question I see in the comments is on a treated pine, in regards to stain, treated pine lumber in general, how long do you let it cure or rest or whatever term you want to use uh, before putting on stain? So the fence in the background here that you see here was stained on, on the, the day. It was 24 hours old when it was stained, so it was soaking wet. Um, anything's better than nothing. I would I would go too soon before I went too late because you you when you stain new wood, the grain pops and it looks beautiful. When you stain wood that's a year and a half or two years old, you just lose all that definition and it just goes to more of a color instead of a, a really, a really de defined uh, wood grain look. But for most people, we, we tell everybody 13% or less on the moisture content. And you can usually achieve that uh, in the summertime in a week or two. And in the wintertime, usually a week or two. In Tennessee, our humidity is way less in the wintertime. So a fence, if it hasn't rained, a fence will dry quickly, quickly in the, in the wintertime. So, you know, a couple of weeks, get you a moisture meter and check it. And, uh, and you'll be ready to roll if it, when it gets that 13% mark. 
Yeah. Caleb, that's the answer I was hoping you'd give because that's, that's typically what I respond with is it's not a time based, it's a moisture content based decision. Well, and, and the argument that we're going to get on that is well, it's not fully aged or fully cured. So the wood grain isn't opened up. It's not going to absorb as much stain. You're right. It's not going to absorb as much stain as a year old fence. But the US Forest Products Lab did tons of studies uh, funded by the government. And the, the wood, if you would look at a test, there's one in particular I'm thinking of, and it was pre-stained uh, siding, pre-finished siding versus siding that was, was coated 10 days after it had been exposed in the sunlight. And mm -hmm. at 25 years, at, at the 25 year mark, they did this test for over 25 years, the pre-stained things that were stained on all six sides before it was exposed to the sun still looked pretty darn good in the stuff that weight was 10 days after it had been exposed to the sun it just there was nothing left so interesting you can you can make your own your own opinions off of that but the the sooner the better i would rather stain it when it's three weeks old and then come back two years later and do a tiny maintenance coat maybe takes you a third of the time a third of the product a third of the cost um, as opposed to waiting a year or two and using twice as much material and just not getting as good of a look. You're probably going to have to clean it, you know, so it's cheaper to go ahead and stain it up front and it's much more beautiful. Well, and yeah, and you're also not worried about what damage has been done that you can't see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah, we get that question a lot, the treated the treated pine question. And honestly, yeah, it's, it's a moisture it's a moisture issue, not necessarily time. Because, you know, the the rule of thumb used to be, and you, you heard all sorts of these, six months, a year, you know, stuff like that. And I, th and I really think the reason that there were those rules of thumb out there was because mo handheld moisture meters weren't readily available. Because that's what grandpa did. Yeah, right. You right. know, the, the yellow wood, the lumber manufacturer, they actually put out a video maybe 10 years ago. Or, you know, I'll look it up and see if we can drop a link in here. But it says finish the job two to three days after it's installed. And that's yellow wood treated pine. And that's, uh, you know, that's what they put out. You know, that's a pretty big statement when you're a company yeah. that big, when you, when you make that statement, you got to stand behind it. So, well, and there's probably data behind the statement. There is. There they, is. they weren't going to just make that as a company state, you know, standard statement without doing some research into it. Mm -hmm. All right. Mandy says that fence behind you that you took her by the other day still looks great. It does. It looks good. So that's kind of, so in a roundabout way, this kind of illustrates the point that, you know, you can, you can do it. You don't have to wait, you know, six months. You could do it, you know, within days. And it's I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do a water base that soon. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because a water base is going to make a coating. So let's, let's, my sticky notes here. <laughs> We're going to put a coating right over top. So you're putting a layer. And it's kind of like a paint, even the ones, even the transparent or semi-transparent water bases that are film forming, they make a layer. And as treated pine dries out um, in the cracks and, and just anywhere where there's sap or things like that, you'll get, some people call it lichen, some people call it sap, but that, those things will come through. And if you're using a paint um, or a water base coating, those things can come through that and that can look kind of bad. On, so on water base, I probably would wait a little while, but if you're going oil based, Man, I would rock and roll as fast as just as soon as you can do it. As soon, if if you've got a fence under contract that you're you're gonna have put in, you need to already have the stain contractor lined up. Gotcha. It's good to know. Well, there we go. And so Jack, Jack, we were asking where he was. Uh, he says, "Do not group him with Seattle. <laughs> He's an hour north." All right. So for the record. Jack is not from Seattle. No. Well, he's almost from K. What city is that? He's an hour. It's the one that's about an hour. It's about an hour north. Um, oh, he is. So I'm, I'm, he must be an hour south of Seattle. Well, maybe. Maybe. Depends how you read that sentence. Yeah, maybe he's an hour north. I, was, I figured Vancouver was an hour north. I'm not sure. Oh, well, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, Seattle. Yeah, yeah, an I, hour north is going to be Canada. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's enough uh, enough ground to go an hour. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I'm, well, we've got a great stain dealer in Vancouver. That's a great cedar market. Nice, nice. Where yeah, all the yeah. cedar comes from. You know, I wish, I wish we had access to 
you know, a lot, a lot of times I wish like I could wave a magic wand and just have access to a lot of the really nice wood material that, you know, the West coast in general, specifically kind of the Pacific Northwest has access to man. I mean, specifically redwood. You've got to go to Rubens with me and see it. It's unbelievable. I, I tell you what, just, yeah, after I'm, after I met Ruben, so we're talking about Rubenborg, Rubenborg fence uh, and California. So after meeting with him and like just chatting with him for five minutes, like I wanted to learn everything about this guy and his business. Mm-hmm. Uh, just cause he obviously has a lot of things figured out. Uh, just looking at the redwood fence that they do and they do all sorts of stuff out of redwood, but I'm interested in the fence specifically. Uh, it's amazing how good that yeah. looks. It's so stable. The, the, I mean, that's the main thing. It's a heavy duty wood, but it's very stable. It's, it's stable. I mean, that's yeah. the, the main thing. It's not, it's not warping. It's not cupping on people. And they're using, I think, Doug fur and and fur. Uh, it's a, it's a, there's a mix, but they've got treated there too for their for their some of their kickboards and and their posts. And it's like a treated Doug fur, and it's super heavy duty and solid. And it's uh, they they've really got a, a nice lumber up there that we just don't get here in Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. You know, and that's the other thing I've seen. You know, it's funny seeing like what what types of fence are standard in different regions. Yeah. You know, because here in Missouri, specifically Southwest Missouri, like kickboards are not a thing. Yeah. Like just nobody does them. Uh, I'd kind of wish that they that they were more prevalent, uh, only because it helps you have a really nice top line if you've yeah. got the kickboard because you can overlap. And uh, but they are just not. They're not a thing. The way I test the market out is usually at the home shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, so well. So we should be having an HBA, the Home Builder Association home show in late January, but it's now been pushed to a Mother's Day weekend of all times. Um, and then the Lawn and Garden show is typically in February. But so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll do a few panels. Usually it's a 40 foot wide booth and I'll do about half of it in our standard fence, the fence that we do every day, day in, day out. And I'll do half of it in just like experimental fence, like some different styles that I want to kind of gauge the market and see, you know, see what people think. So for example, last year we, uh, we did one a really nice section with cap and trim because you see that a lot in larger markets where that's just a standard for them. Yeah. There, there was very little interest and the interest oh. was there when we talked about the difference in price from just a standard privacy, six foot privacy to privacy with cap and trim. That shot that shut the conversation down immediately. Isn't that amazing? It is. It, it, and it's as a fence builder, I want to build that the the cap and trim. I want to build something that looks very nice, oh, you know, yeah. more finished. Um, but so that that received you know no actual you know legitimate interest. But we also so two years ago we did a few sections out of uh, six foot privacy with a kickboard just because I wanted to try that. I wanted to get into that and it received no attention. Everyone thought it would just look so different having a different colored kickboard than the rest of the fence. Isn't that funny? And it, it, it's yeah. But in other markets, that's the standard. They wouldn't think yeah. of building fence without a kickboard. Yeah. Well, you go to Dallas and everything looks one way you go to Canada and it's all one way you go to California and it's a totally different style. And then you go to some place yeah. and they don't even, they have concrete fences, you know, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, a different kind of, I've always been amazed by that too. And I think it's the locality too, the, what they have available locally. Well, that's it. That, that's absolutely it. So Jack clarified his location with us. I'm sure everyone is wanting to make sure he's in Mount Vernon, which is, so he's an hour to the north. So two hours to Canada. Okay. Okay. Two hours from Seattle to Canada. All right. There you go. So he's right in the middle. Never been here. Down in Canada. No, but I see pictures and it looks beautiful up there. Really, yeah, good. We, Andy Salk at the One Stop Fence Shop in British Columbia, Vancouver, BC. The pictures he lives in a tropical. It says it's a rainforest. It's just unbelievable the pictures he shows me. Yeah, that's that's the thing is, and especially like you know, everyone's seen the pictures that I mean, I, mean, I, I assume everyone you know when we're in, when we're in grade school, they're talking about the redwood forest, and and there's those iconic pictures of you know roads going through trees. You know, that they're so big that you could drive a car through them. Mm-hmm. I would love to experience that, like, or just something to that effect in person. Yeah. The perspective would just be 
unreal. Well, I, can you can you imagine coming out west in the 1800s or 1700s and 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 finding that forest and and walking through that those towering over your head? That'd be a remarkable. Yeah, they've remarkable. been growing there for generations. Yeah, unreal. Surface therapy says, I know there are many variables, but what would you say lifespan of a cedar fence that has been stained or maintained versus cedar fence that has never been stained? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, if I built the fence, you know, I know you, I know you like steel post. Yeah. Uh, we, we either a steel post or a post with a post saver sleeve. Yep. Uh, you could virtually make it last indefinitely as long as you stayed on top of the maintenance. Yeah. Well, because, you know, at least here in our market, the number one reason for fence replacement is, excuse me, post drop. Yeah. You know, structure is the post is leaning or, or has already fallen over. Uh, just the post are the post fail. Um, very rarely. And I would really have to go back through some records to find, you know, a wood fence that we replaced because the, pickets failed or the cross members failed like that's just really yeah, not a thing. it doesn't happen yeah i've seen it a few times but when i was in the fence business um there was uh, a ton of four by four by seven full cut posts that came into the market everybody uses we do four four board fence here four plank okay uh, roughs on what, what it depends horse fence depends mm -hmm. on what, where you are what you call it yeah and everybody was putting it up in a year or two years later it all rotted and just fences were falling down everywhere um, not, uh, it was our fences. It was every, every company in Nashville that was buying material got some of this stuff and they all got sued. Were they, was that a colored post? No, it, was, it was just a treated pine four by four, seven post. We pulled core sample. You know, there was a big class action lawsuit. We pulled core samples and it was treated, but the treatment was no good. And, uh, so, so that's why a lot of people ask me, why do you believe so much in, in the post saver? Uh, when I heard about the post saver sleeve and got an opportunity to be a distributor for it, I jumped on it because I had an emotional attachment or an emotional involvement. You know, we felt the pain over, yeah. the, you know, if a post isn't treated properly, you're, you know, everybody says, well, my posts are treated. Well, all the posts that have rotted and fallen over uh, are generally treated posts. So if you've got the, if you've, you've got the foundation taken care of either steel post or, or, uh, or a post saver sleeve on there, yeah, we actually we spent, we spent a good amount of time talking last week about the post saver products because um, mm -hmm. that question came up a couple times last week. Really? Yeah, yeah, it, the question came up about you know how can you prolong the life of you know a, a treated pine post, and yeah, that's that is absolutely the product that I recommend. Yeah, well, that where it is it? It's backwards on my screen, but yeah, but that's it. This thing goes in the ground. That that ground line right here, right here is 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 a lot of people say well why doesn't the sleeve go all the way to the ground uh to the bottom see the sleeve lives right man this thing is yep. backwards. so the sleeve lives right here it's a 16 inch sleeve and it's that eight inch area from the ground down uh where the where there's enough oxygen and moisture content for uh for there to be organic uh what do you call them i, I don't know what they're called but they're these little green things you know those yeah little, it's kind of the aerobic zone they, of they, the world. They eat wood, and those sleeves have been around since 1994 with, without a failure. And I think 2020, we pulled out, put them out of the ground for a 20-year test, zero rot. 20-year wow. test, zero rot. So, um, so, so those things are going to last a lot longer than 20 years for sure. Um, Caleb, let me do this. I need to step out for just a second. Someone's wanting my attention right outside. All right. Um, if we could do this, could you could you elaborate just a little bit more on that post saver? Just because it's come up the last several, the yeah. last several yeah. times, and, and I've talked about it, but I'd love to have you know an expert in the product. I will. I will. I'll talk about a post saver sleep, and I may look for. I don't have one handy, but okay. so so I'm just going to talk here about the post saver sleep. I don't know if questions will pop up or not, but the post saver sleeve is a thermoplastic ground line barrier that has bitumen or asphalt inside of it. Um, you put that, you slide it right over the post and uh, it, it pretty much just like the, the little rubber stopper here on this, on this thing, it slides up on the post, you heat it with a, with a torch and it shrink wraps right onto that post. And now you have a guaranteed 
uh, 20 year guarantee, post replacement guarantee for ground rot. And they really work and they're fast, they're cheap to install. You can put one on in about 45 seconds. And there's tons of third party test data, there's tons of university studies on it, but um, the fact is that it works. And it's a, it's a great cheap way to ensure a long life of your post. And the main thing is that it's cheap and it's easy. And uh, in a world where we have lumber shortages, it's great to have products like that that you can use to get some long life out of your post. So that's it. We're a distributor for them. We sell them all over the U.S. and we believe in them. So, you know, if you're thinking about putting up a wood fence with wood post, I would not do it if you do not put a post saver sleeve on it. Somebody's bringing me a sleeve. So here they are. Look at here. So this is a post saver sleeve. Simple as that. You open them up, you slide it into the up on the post in the ground line. I don't know if you can see it, but the ground line is right here, Joe. So all of this from here down is uh, is below grade. You can see the beautiful picture there. It shows you exactly how it works. But uh, this thing right here, man, it is it is a great, great thing. I wish I had thought about it. So, okay. hey, if you talked about the installation, how hard is that to install on a post? Yeah, it, it's it's fast. It's super fast. You slide it up on the post and uh, and you heat shrink it on with a torch, any kind of a propane torch. I've got a guy uh, that I know who can do about a thousand of them a day by himself. Um, at one of Ruben's guys, Cameron, we'll give him Cameron a shout out. He, he, he him with one helper. Um, a lady, a female helper, um, they can put on a thousand sleeves a day on a four by four by 12 post. They use tall, okay. post. Or maybe it's a four by four by 10, but it's, it's not an eight footer. It's, it's a super long post. Yeah. And, um, you know, they work, people believe in them. And, uh, and so on that, on that sleeve. So I would imagine you're measuring up from the bottom of the post and then installing that sleeve at a predetermined measurement. And it depends on what you set your depth to. In Tennessee, we set them at two feet, 24 inches. So 24 inches would be right here. So you basically, you, you, you get yourself a, a measurer. Yep. We'll just call it this. And you make it 26 inches and you just hold it up on the post, slide it up on there. When you get it right, you stop and you heat it with a torch and that's it. It's done. It's pretty quick. It's, it's, it's 45 seconds a post. You know, if you're slow, uh, there's some guys who can do it in about half that time. But uh, you, you, can, you can do them at the job site. You can do them at the shop. Yeah. You can do them, you know, even there's some suppliers will we'll pre-sleeve post for suppliers. And I think that's going to be huge in 2021. Okay. That makes if, sense. If you put, put pre-sleeved post by your front door and then non-sleeved post by your front door, see which ones will sell. And I can, I can, yeah, you're going to be surprised. You know? Well, you know, in, in Caleb, so it, you know, that's kind of in the same discussion as, you know, do you pre-stain a fence, right? It's it's adding value because you're adding longevity to the fence itself. Yep. Which is which is a value to the customer, ultimately. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we joke about that, you know, when we're installing steel post, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to put us out of business, <laughs> you yeah. know, because... People say that. People say, well, I don't want to do something that's long lasting. I don't want to use steel post. I don't want to use post savers. I don't want to use stain because I want to rebuild that fence in five years. How many fences a year do you go back and that are fences that you built and you replace? It's not very often. It's usually at least 10 years. So, you know, that's just, I, I don't even acknowledge that as an argument. No, it, it, well, there are two different viewpoints, Caleb. Is it's kind of how I view it. You can be you can be of the opinion that I am here to do what's best for me and my business, or I am here to do what's best for my community and in our clients. Yeah, I think the latter of those visions is the one that succeeds. Well, let me give you a give you a little example, and you'll agree with this. You you you're a homeowner, and, and maybe you're one of those homeowners who call five guys out or ten contractors, whatever. And, and you get a quote from everyone. And one guy, maybe, maybe you're, maybe my company is the most expensive, but my, my fence comes um, with pre-sleeved, pre, pre-sleeved pre post. So 20 year post guarantee on top of, of my guarantee, it's pre-stained. And then there's fence armor added on, you know, you know, the fence armor pieces, maybe yeah. you add those weed eater guards on and um, I'll call them weed eater guards. So people kind of can understand what we're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and you put that on, maybe your fence is $450 more than everyone else's, but you, you've got a, you, you're, you're just knocking them dead with warranties and, and then the beautification with a stain. 
I'll tell you what, one thing that I've noticed throughout the whole United States, defense contractors that are crushing it are premium guys. They're selling the, they're selling good stuff. They're not, you know, nobody goes to the, and pays 90 grand for a, for a Volkswagen, you know, you go get a Mercedes for 90 grand and right. people are willing to pay it because they want that added value. You want to do things once we live in a world where we throw everything away. We use it once and throw it away. People are yearning for, for quality. They want to buy things the way their grandparents did. I think a lot of times. So if we can sell them that quality, yeah, it costs more, but we're not taking advantage of them. We're actually giving them, uh, a great value because they're not having to throw this fence away in four or five or seven years. They're getting something that they can pass on. You know, when, when they give their house to their kids and they're dead and gone, the fence is still there. So, yeah. Well, yeah. and you know, when we're talking, when we're talking about business in general, you want your business to have a unique selling proposition, mm -hmm. right? What, what sets you apart from your competition and quality almost always wins. Quality. Right. And I say almost always because there will always be a percentage of the marketplace that wants the best, you know, I'll say best value, but we both know it's not the best value. It's just the cheapest fence. Value engineering, uh, that, that's you know, right. that term lately. Yeah. That's right. yeah and that, that's it. If you're, if you're flipping a house and there, there's some guys that they can't fit into the budget, but if, if right. you're going to be here for another 20 years, why would you not spend a few extra bucks? Well, that's, that's it. That's it. Absolutely. And to your point is, you know, so because we have people that say, well, I'm looking for a, a value fence. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're going to want this fence for us. It's the fence with, with a steel post. They say, well, that's the most expensive. Yeah. It's also the longest lasting. Uh, you know, we could talk to you about a fence with wood post, I suppose. Now this was like pre wood shortage or whatever, but we could talk to you about a fence with wood post, but you're going to be replacing it significantly sooner than one with steel post. You know, this is before the post savers came in the conversation. Uh, so wouldn't the best value be the fence that you only have to pay for once? Well, Zig Ziglar tells a story about a bicycle very similar to that. Yep. Yep. That's the way it is. So uh, let's catch up on the comments for just quick. Cause I want to, I yeah, want to talk good. to you about another, I want to talk to you about the fence armor as well. Um, so let's see. So KO Construction says here in Tennessee, we recommend you treat your wood fencing ASAP. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one thing, and I and I took this, I took this comment straight from you, Caleb. Is you know, you had said when people ask you when's the best time to schedule or how long do I need to wait to schedule my fence to be stained, you know, your answer is typically right now. Yeah. You know, we're, you know, we're always several weeks out, you know, in the summer, I'm sure you're kind of like us to where it gets six or eight weeks out. Uh, so schedule it now so that, you know, your fence is ready to, you know, to be stained as soon as we can get to it. Yeah. We, we love it when fence contractors send us the paperwork and said, Hey, we, we just sold this fence or we're thinking about selling this fence. Can you go ahead and quote this? And, and we will. And usually that's the best. And if you're a stain contractor, if you're listening to this, or a fence contractor, when's the best time to, to sell the service of, of staining a fence? It is, is, it's at the time of your, that they buy the fence, yeah. you know, it's like going and buying a, you know, something and, and you get the accessories with it while you're there. You know, you don't, you don't buy, when you buy a barbecue grill, you don't get the charcoal later, you get the charcoal on the same day. So yeah. um, I, I find our close rate on service is if, before they even bought the fence, they're buying the fence. They close the deal on the fence. They close the deal with us. Yep. Their, their work is done. Now they just sit back and watch us go to work. Yeah. The way, the way we word it is, you know, and again, so this is pre pandemic when we were actually sitting in a customer's living room. Um, but we'd say, you know, Mr. Miss customer, we, here's your proposals for the fencing. You we typically have three different options. Uh, one of those options also includes staining, you know, now it's pre stain. Then it was a staining yeah. service. You know, regardless of whether or not we're the contractor you choose, this fence should be stained as soon as possible to provide longevity. And it should you decide that you would like it stained, here's the number for the staining. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it it shows, you know, when you when you word it something similar to that, it shows that, hey, I'm here because I care about your fence. You know, whether you use me or not, you really need to stain this thing. 
because you only want to pay for it once, right? You want to prolong the life of that fence, right? Then you definitely need to get it stained. So I just went ahead and included the number in my proposal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or, or, I pro- or pro- so there's some guys, I forget who it was. One of the guys in the group was talking about this uh, earlier, uh, a little while ago. So he's a fencing contractor that also stains. And so he'll provide a separate proposal for staining. So they don't pre-stain, they, they, they post-stain. Uh, but he, he's found that he gets staining business sometimes when he doesn't even build the fence. Yeah, yeah. So he'll say, you know, regardless of who builds a fence, it needs to be stained. Here is a separate proposal for the staining. That's smart. And then he can invoice it separately. So if he builds it, he can, he can, he can get paid on the construction and then he can yeah. then stain it later. Well, and I mean, you, there's a lot of ways to, pr- to propose this, but you could also say, you know, there's guys out there that say, you know, if you group multiple services together, you know, there's a discount associated with that. You know, if you choose th- two or more of my services, it's X or three or more. I'm not generally a, a huge proponent of discounting services. I like adding value. I, I like, yeah, I don't like my memory's brilliant, but it's only about five minutes long. So I don't like that. I like to give the best value I can right up front. And, and yep. that's, yeah, I prefer to do it. But everybody's different. A lot of people sure. love love discounts. Well, it yeah, absolutely. And, and it probably depends on the market, too. But is right? a discount really a discount? No, it's not. It, it, yeah, it it's a marketing tactic, you know. The way that's the way I see it, anyways. So yeah, well, and and here's the thing. So I'll I'll kind of let everyone in on our winter special at Ozark Fence is we are we're offering pre stain for the price of a regular cedar fence. So we will upgrade you to to a pre stain product for no additional charge. Yeah, and I know why you're doing that. You want to get the word on the street about pre stain. So you're yeah. Giving, I would that, love to get more stain. That, fences. that truly is a discount the way you're doing that. Well, that's the thing. So and that, that's my point is I could say I'm adding value by upgrading you for no additional charge, or I could say I'm discounting it by 10%. Yeah. Those two figures are roughly the same. Yep. Whether I say I'm going to discount your, your pre saying by 10% or if, or if I say it's a free upgrade. You know, I'll take the, I'll take the free upgrade all day. Well, yeah, absolutely. And then also next spring when our book, you know, our book of business is full for the spring and we're, we're done offering upgrades or, we're, you know, it doesn't sting as much to take away a free upgrade as it does a discount. Yeah. Because there's specifically if, if you have a customer that calls you from, from the winter time who wants their discount and, and then you're, you're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, then the mentality is, Oh, so that 10% is going in your pocket. Like you could have done this for 10% less. You told me you could. Yeah. But now you can't. Yeah. So you're just keeping that money. Well, it, that's the way things seem, aren't they? Yeah. It's a mentality. It, it's, yeah. it's all in how you look at it, but the free upgrade, the, the free upgrade period has expired. And you see this concept used in car sales. You see it, you, you see it used across the board, the free upgrade. And actually I'll tell you who, if he's still here, Mr. Fence actually kind of really got this, the ball rolling in my head on the free upgrade versus discounts. Um, he does it. I would love to pick his brain on this. So what he does is there's a, or what I've heard him say he does is so during the big, you know, home show there, they actually have an open house at their location, at their physical location. Mm -hmm. And so what they'll say is all the people that come through the show, they say, Hey, actually we're having an open house at our location where you can see touch feel, get to know all the products and also we have salesmen on site or they probably call them consultants on site, ready to look at your project. And if you pull the trigger, you know, if you accept the project during, you know, this promotional period, we'll actually upgrade your fence. If we're talking about like an aluminum fence, we'll actually upgrade you to an arch top gate for no additional charge. Yeah. And that's a great add on because that, that does cost more money. It's a great add on. Absolutely. It's, it's a value. It's a value increase for the client. And so that, so I'll credit Sean with that because that really got the ball rolling in my head is how can we offer a value upgrade to our offerings? And for us, it's stain, you know, to your point initially was, uh, I want more stain in my marketplace. I want more stain fences in my marketplace so that it see, so that people see it as more commonplace. Yeah. You want that. And you want them to see a fence going up already stained. Yeah. And where do they get that? Ozark fence. There's one place and it's us. And, and we sell retail too. 
you know, so we also want it to seem common for the other fence guys that may not have access to pre-stained pickets. It's, oh, okay, so it's actually not, it's actually no harder to install these things. It's literally the same installation process, but now I can provide a nicer, you know, finished product to my clients. Yeah. No, no you're on the right path. Let's see. So, uh, let's see. Mandy said, so she can provide a link to the application of the post saver product. Thank you very much, Mandy. Jack Clevenger. So this is still in response to the post saver. They work great. Great company too. Al is a great guy to work with. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I've never met Al in person, but we've chatted, you know, when, when we were looking at the post savers back in the day, uh, we've chatted via email correspondence and he seems like an incredibly good guy. Al is his, like, like a father to me. He's a great, great guy. Very cool. Bo's got a question. Bo Butler says, Joe, do you offer a warranty on your fences? If so, how long? We do. So all the fin any fence we install, period, all of them have a lifetime workmanship warranty. And it and that's in addition to whatever material warranties. And I and I add that because you know if we're talking about you know, an Ameristar montage ornamental steel, they've got a lifetime warranty on their product, on the material portion of their product. Uh, the, you know, the Postmaster steel post that we use on wood fence has a material warranty. So we do our part by warranting the workmanship for life. And we didn't always do this. So the industry standards, you know, typically one year, one year workmanship warranty on any fence. And except for it was, oh, it's probably a year and a half, two years ago now, I was talking with my wood crew chief, I was like, Scott, how often would you say that we go on a warranty call for workmanship outside of that 12 month window? He's like, ah, you know, it's rare, maybe once a quarter, something like that. So, okay. So how many of those, so four, t four times a year on average, how many of those four do we invoice out? He's like, oh, we, ty we typically don't because we pair it with an installation that's in the neighborhood or in the area at least. Uh, we just go knock it out real quick. We leave them a note on the door that says we fixed it, and then we moved on. So, okay, so we're actually offering an extended warranty, but we're calling it a one-year warranty. You know, it, we don't have a cutoff, so why are we telling people we do? Uh, so we went to a lifetime workmanship. Because yeah. you know, if, if the fence is installed correctly, then the workmanship's going to, you know, any workmanship issue is going to become readily apparent in the beginning, within the first year. Right. So I, rarely do we see workmanship issues that are eight years in the in the future. Those are typically uh, material warranty issues. Yeah. I'm not a manufacturer. I'm not a, a wood manufacturer. I'm not a steel manufacturer. I can't control the process of making the materials, but I can control the workmanship, the installation practices, the procedures my guys follow to install the fence. And I'm comfortable enough with that to offer a lifetime workmanship warranty. Yeah. You know, Joe, we do the same thing. If, if somebody calls us with a workmanship issue two years or three years in, you think we're going to turn our nose up at it? Absolutely not. We no. still it's, it's a great opportunity to surprise someone too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll have, here's the, here's the, here's our wow moment, I guess is so say for us, it's gates. Now we use a steel post, steel frame, steel hardware, the whole thing. But the one weakness of one of these gates is, if this gate is left open, you know, slightly, if it's left, I don't know how to, if it's left ajar, right? If it's not solidly closed and the wind catches that and whips it open or whips it shut, it can come out of adjustment. You know, right. just a lot of force on those hinges. It can rotate them on the post. So occasionally we'll get that call that, you know what? These gates, they just came out of adjustment. Oh, okay. No problem. Well, with the lifetime workmanship warranty, We'll absolutely come out there and assess it and hopefully fix it in the same day, you know, the same day that we come out. Uh, and so the guys go out there and almost always, and you can tell, so with the shark hinges we use, they, they clamp on, they're like a 180 degree hinge for you fence guys out there. So they clamp onto the post and they have jaw or teeth that are fixed to the post. You can tell when this hinge has been physically moved around the post, it leaves those bite marks for lack of a better term on the posts. So if you see the bite marks, you know, it was wind damage or something forced that gator out yeah, the lawnmower or something. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, right. Exactly. So, and the customer knows it, right. They know it didn't just 
fallout of adjustment, but what they're hoping is you won't catch it. And so, but we always, we always, you know, present the problem, Mr. Miss customer. Uh, if, if you've got a few minutes to look at this gate, I've actually figured out what happened. So here you can see the gates, the hinges themselves has, have actually been physically moved around this post. You know, you probably didn't even notice it happened. It was probably wind that caught this thing or somebody really slammed this gate. Something happened that physically moved these hinges. Uh, but I tell you what, it was a five minute deal. I fixed it. It's in perfect alignment and adjustment. There's no, we're going to go ahead and just call this a warranty issue. <clears throat> Is it technically a warranty issue? Eh, probably not, but nobody's going to care. I'm already here. I already fixed it. I hope you have a great day. Is there anything else we can look at? That's always the question. Is there anything else while we're here that we can look at in the fence to see if I can fix anything while I'm here? And we'll, we'll get some pretty, pretty positive feedback on that because the customer didn't expect that to be a warranty, right? Yeah. They expected once we caught it, they expected there to be some sort of charge. And there's absolutely no reason for there to be a charge in that because it, it takes five minutes. The guys are already there. Fix it. Ask them if they have anything else to move on. And, and that's another that's another thing that I notice on guys that sell quality and premium service. They can afford to go back and fix things. Yeah, you know, sure. when I was when I was at Rubens, they I went um, I did a ride along. Me and one of our salesmen, we did a ride along with his his managers, and uh, there were there were a couple of places we went and looked at things that I thought were perfectly fine. They were perfectly fine, but the customer didn't like it. They wanted it changed, and he he changed it. No problem. No questions asked. It's done. It yep. cost him some money, but he, he charged a premium price and, and, and provided a premium service. Well, here's here's my thought on that too, Caleb. So did it cost money? Yes. But what is the return on that investment, right? If it, if it cost him random money, if it cost him $75 or whatever the number is, what's the return on that $75 investment? It's probably pretty huge, you know, especially if it turns that customer into a cheerleader, you know, a, a brand cheerleader. Because- mm -hmm. I mean, we've all seen it, right? We've all been in Facebook. We've been tagged in Facebook groups that someone says, hey, who do you know that builds fence? And then three or four people tag you in the Facebook comments. Oh, yeah. It, that is invaluable. You know, that return. So you, you know, you not charging them the $75 or whatever it costs you, it gets paid back, you know, in spades just because now you've got a brand cheerleader. Now you've got one more person tagging you yeah. in these comments that, you know, I... I would pay $75 all day to get, you know, raving fans. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can't advertise that for, for that price. You can't. No, absolutely not. Well, and it feels good too, Joe. Doesn't it feel good to do something good for the Well, that's the thing. And ultimately if we're talking about, you know, th this conversation comes up when we're talking about like the community involvement that Ozark fence has, you know, the, what we're doing for the kids and community and stuff like that. And, you know, because, and people always ask, well, why do you do it? Like, what's the motivation? For me, it feels good. Like, I, I really enjoy it. But when you're talking to purely business folks, that's not quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't say, you know, it made me feel incredibly good when I went to bed that night. You know, you can't quantify that. So you back it up with numbers, right? You, you talk about return on investment. But ultimately, yeah, absolutely. It makes you feel great that you're – giving back to the community that ultimately supports you, right? You so our fence company is 65 years old. That means our community has supported us for 65 years by continuing to trust us with their business and trust us with their recommendations. So how can we give back? Well, we give back to the community. You know, we reinvest those dollars back into, for us, we prefer to do it in, you know, child-related organizations, you know, whether it's Diaper Bank of the Ozarks or whether I'm involved with an organization called Sertoma, which is service to mankind. And our local chapter is is all about children, children's health, you know, children's betterment, that sort of thing. Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, those types of programs. Uh, but everyone can be different, right? Everyone can support their community in different ways. Um, yeah. But ultimately, it ultimately it makes you feel pretty good. Do what is right. Bo followed this up by saying, uh, we offer a five-year workmanship, and that is the best in our market. We want to go to a lifetime, but a lot of the HOA-required fences are of extremely poor design and just don't last very long. Um, so, Bo, here's 
here's my thought, and then I'd like to get Kale's thought on this as well. So my thought is, if we're talking about a poorly designed fence, that's not really a workmanship issue, right? That's a design issue, or that's something to that effect. Um, and, and so here's my question to you: So you offer a five year workmanship warranty. If a fence, if you get a warranty call and you send guys out and come to find out the fence was built six years ago, do you charge the customer or or do you fix it while you're there, you know, because you know that it's the right thing to do? My guess is you fix it, right? Oh, and if it's a poorly designed, then you talk about, you know, reworking the design or something to that effect, which isn't, in my mind, that's not workmanship. You know, workmanship is something that I control, whether it's the process my guys use, the equipment, you know, things that I can control. I can't control an HOA's design requirements. So that's not a workmanship issue in my mind. Yeah. Hey, what are your thoughts? Joe, the first thing I would do is I would I would explain to the to to the HOA the, the design flaws and show, hey, you know, science or experience has shown that the fence could fail here and here. Here's my recommendation to fix it. Who can I talk to at the HOA or at the uh, at the uh, management company that is over 100 HOAs that I could show this to? And it, the my end goal would be to to be, you know, like we have Gertner here in, in the South. It's one of the biggest uh, property management companies in the United States. My goal would be to be the fence consultant for Gertner and, and let me be the designer for every fence that goes in and every HOA. True. And if, you, if that's to me, that's what I see. When I see that situation, I say I'm putting a work a lifetime warranty on it uh, for workmanship. And um, let's let's see what we can do to work our way up to to get in there to, to help the community uh, fix this poor design on not just this neighborhood, but all of them. Yeah, and that's the thing is, is, Bo, it sounds like you've got a very good idea of the problem with the design, right? You've probably dealt with multiple of these fences failing due to the design. So it would probably be pretty easy to put together a presentation for the board or for the management company that says, this is an issue that I see in your neighborhoods, and I'd like to bring it to your attention. Is, you know, regardless who you have fix it or regardless of what changes you make, like these are the problems that you need to make. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to bring it to your attention because I see it a lot. You know, yeah. your residents are having to pay, you know, money to fix a fence simply because it's one design flaw. And if it were tweaked, it would make all the difference in the world. Yeah. I but think you're, you're, you're right on the money. You know, I, I was going to say before I rudely interrupted you there, I'm sorry about that. Um, last year, 2020, um, I don't know how many hundred fences we stained in neighborhoods that were required to be stained a certain color, a certain brand. And we stained all of them with our stain. And, you know, we were able to do that because we just showed the benefits of, of our product. We showed um, a, a small, you know, we didn't even really have to show a presentation. Basically, you just show them pictures and uh, explain why this product is, is, is a better choice for their neighborhood. The color is the same. And, and that's what we do. So now when we get a call in these neighborhoods, we, we already have our stain in, in the neighborhood just because we presented, we pleaded our case and, and they heard us. Well, that's the thing is these, the HOA board or the management company, their mission is to, you know, maintain or increase property values of that subdivision. Right. Like that's their goal. That's their motivation. Yeah. And so as long as you present it in that vein of, Here's an issue I see a lot in your neighborhood, and it's really, you know, if you make this one design change or a design change similar to this, it could really help prolong the lives of these fences, which will ultimately leave them looking better longer, which we all know is great for your neighborhood. You know, as long as you present it in the correct vein or the correct conversation type, I mean, it's a conversation I think that they would be very willing to have. There's a key word that, that community managers want to hear. And that's consistency. Yeah. If, if we fix this problem, your new fences and old fences are now going to be consistent. They're not going to be falling apart at five years. They're going to stay looking good. And, you know, we really recommend a stain and seal and wash program on a three or five year interval. Uh, we can we can offer that to you, too. It's a great time. To, I mean, that is such a great time to get in the face of those people and become their their fence guy. I mean, I would Bo, I would take this time. I would take this as an as a. Uh, 
as an opportunity to, to really get in there and, and get those jobs. The guy I was talking about earlier that does about $3 million of the fence and he doesn't have a piece of wood at his house. I, I get a ton of his paper. He sends us all his jobs. We, we do all the fences. Uh, we stain all of his fences and I don't know, seven out of 10 of them. So, you know, every job says the source where they got the job from HOA, HOA, HOA. And it, it's, um, uh, or developer, HOA or developer. And that's, they build those relationships and you've got the perfect conversation starter right there. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're already, you're already familiar with the problem because you fixed the problem. So now uh, just by bringing that to the board or the management company's attention, now you're the local expert that not only is complaining about the problem, but you have the solution. Yeah. And the, the, the reason that you're having this problem is because nobody has stood up because what happens with HOAs, they said, you know, over at Cloverfield, uh, we did this fence and we did it at Stonebridge. So this new one, um, Kelsey Glenn or whatever, let's just use the same fence we used over there. And then they just keep rubber stamping it. Same stain color, same style over and over again. And until yeah. somebody gets in there and breaks that mold, they're going to just keep doing it. So yeah, we see that be a hero. We see that in the covenants and restrictions. Like mm -hmm. it's all boilerplate, you know, the, per developer. The developer just, the, you know, they put together covenants and restrictions, and that's just the one they use. They change out the name of the subdivision in the header, and then that's just what they use. Uh, in in my specific example, so the developer that built this neighborhood loves shadow box fences because, in his opinion, they look good on both sides. So there's no conversation about well, is a good side facing in or out. Now, the thing is, I don't know the developer personally, but I have to think that he does not have a shadow box fence at his house. Mm -hmm. Because if you had a shadow box fence, you know how much of a nightmare they are to maintain. You know, we were talking about staining them earlier, but just from a lawn care perspective, yeah, weeding. weeding in between those pickets, it's a it's a pain. And they're not private. You can see through them at an angle. It's there's not a significant benefit to wind load that anyone can demonstrate to me. No. So, so I moved in this neighborhood and it's all shadow box. Everyone has a shadow box fence because that's just always the way it's ever been. All right. Well, me being a fence guy, I wanted to replace my fence because there's four different neighbors have all built fences at different times. They have different boards, different widths. And as a fence guy, it drives me bonkers. But first, I went to the board and I said, now, this is a little bit different conversation because I live here. But after one of the board meetings, I just said, hey, guys, can I who's on the architectural committee? Can I chat with them? And it's the same guys. Right. This is not a big neighborhood, but they have an architectural committee. And so I was like, hey, what's the deal with shadow box fences? Like as a fence guy, I have to tell you they are a nightmare to put up. They're a nightmare to maintain. Like and if you guys have shadow box fences in your yards you know how much of a nightmare they are to try to edge with a weed eater. Can we talk about doing away with a shadow box thing? Like, you know, yeah, you, we never really thought about why do we do shadow box fence? It's twice as, I mean, it's way more expensive. So you saved the whole neighborhood a, a pile of change. When I told him, I said, here's the reason why shadow box fence is because the last 20 of his neighborhoods have all been shadow box fences. And that, to exactly your point, Caleb, is they said, well, it's worked over here and over there. Let's just, it's just in the covenants and restrictions. They don't care about the fence. They just care about having something in the restrictions about it so that no one's putting up chicken wire. Ken right? says over and over. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So anyway, so Bo, actually, so Bo followed this up with a comment as well. Um, so my question was, if it was in six years, would you take care of it? And of course you would. Absolutely. We'd take care of it. It's very yeah. true. I've never thought about personally trying to help change the design in these developments. Bo, you could be the local expert. Yeah. yeah. How many times do you, you know, when you're building fence that you drive through these neighborhoods and every new neighborhood's got the same fence guys sign on it and you go, how does he get those jobs? That what I just laid out, that's how you get those jobs. You yeah. got to, got to go and be helpful. And uh, that's it. Yeah. He became yeah. the guy. Yeah. You know, and the way you become the guy is by being helpful and by providing value. And the yeah. thing about that is a lot of, a lot of people from the outside will say, oh, well, that's a good old boy network. Well, maybe, maybe so, but maybe not. Most likely somebody reached out an olive branch and said, hey, you know, we'd like to help you with this or what can we do to help? A lot of developers don't even have a problem. They just, you know, if you called up a developer and said, hey, man, if, if I can ever do anything for you, 
please let me know. And uh, they're going to go, hey, I need, I need a fence. I'm, who's that guy that called me last week? I'm going to call him up. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Bo, and to answer your original question with your five-year workmanship, you actually have a longer-term warranty, right? You call it a five-year workmanship, and you want it to be a, long, a lifetime warranty per se. You're treating it like it is, but you're calling it something different. And it's the same. We were the same way in that we offered a we, on paper. It was a one year warranty. In reality, in execution, it was a lifetime warranty. And so now we just call it what it is. And I, well, and I think you should, too. Yeah. And Bo also just he said he's the only, he has the best warranty in his uh, in his community. Yeah. Uh, don't think others aren't noticing that. And don't think that there's other guys right now not planning out 2021 and saying, you know, Bo, this guy, man, he's got a five year warranty. Uh, he, he outsold me this year. So your competition right now, they're sharpening their axes. They're getting their arrows made up, ready for battle. And uh, you got to be one step ahead of them. So go ahead and bump your warranty up. Yep. And here's, here's, where, here's where our head went to is, so you offer a five-year warranty. How hard is it for those guys that are sharpening their axes to say, oh, yeah, well, we offer a six-year warranty. Oh, yeah, well, we offer a seven-year, eight-year, ten-year yeah. Yeah. Who's going to do you better than lifetime? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, you have multiple lifetime warranty? Like it's, you know, it, it is what it is, right? And, and when, you, when you're wording the warranty, you're just upfront and transparent. We will warranty things that are within our control. Things that are not within our control are, you know, material defects as a result of the manufacturing process design defects as a result of you know stipulations and requirements i mean you, you write it however you want to but just make it clear and very transparent and here's a here's a, wor a word of advice on warranties is i write it so that my daughter could read it right i've got 13 year old daughter i write it so that she could read it there's no therefore and herein twos and none of that yeah right it needs to be straight to the point because then it shows transparency too yeah but it's, yeah, that's absolutely what I would do. So, um, if so, Bo, I would ask you if you're in the uh, if you're in any of the Facebook groups, the fence Facebook groups. Uh, there's a fence king, Dan Bonk. He's out of uh, I believe Louisiana. He had a great post in one of them. I have to go back and find it about his warranty. He puts it on his website, and it's basically it, that, and that's basically it in a nutshell. Is the material warranties are per manufacturer and vary based on manufacturer. And we warranty what is within our control, which is, you know, workmanship. And here's what we warrant. And it's just straight to the point. It could be, it could literally be five or six sentences. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, right. think, I think a, a shorter warranty is better. Absolutely. You know, there's right. anytime, anytime I read any legalese in things that therefore and here twos, I'm like, okay, like what are we trying to hide in here? Yeah, you get uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Absolutely. If you make it, you know, you know, to where a, a middle school grade level can read it, comprehend it, and understand it, then you're good to go. I agree. Kenny Dugan says, "Do you see any new products or styles that that are making us that are making a surge into the new year? See more horizontal and grays on new builds lately. Uh, why don't you take that one, Caleb? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, horizontal. The horizontal fence is is uh, been it's it's been popular for quite a, quite a while. The problem is, um, is getting everybody on the, maybe, I think maybe some standards need to be made on horizontal fences because what I, what I see is warping. I see, uh, no, no bracing in between. If there is, it's all different. So I think, I think as, uh, people get better at horizontal fence, it's going to become more standardized and you're going to see more of it. If, if a contractor gets good at building horizontal fences, he's going to try to sell everybody one. So, as as so yeah i think you're right it's happening here it's happening everywhere there it's going to get to where i believe the horizontal fence is going to be just a tiny bit more than the the regular stockade style or the same price and once that happens everybody's going to want a horizontal fence and uh and gray is the new pecan so everybody interesting. are you are you seeing that on your end caleb where like you know yeah, I mean, we 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 move a lot of grays and in gray tones, but it's nowhere close to the browns and the red sure. additional colors. It's not even it's not even on the same spectrum. Um, okay. 
but it's but you know we still move a lot of gray a lot of people like it um you never yeah that's know. interesting you can almost um yeah, because we get so some of the feedback we get when when folks don't choose to stain it is they like the weathered look i got something for them gray yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's exactly where my mind went when i saw yeah. kenny's comment about seeing grays on new builds i was like you know what that's exactly the right response to i like a weathered look then i've, yeah. I've got a great product for you and it's even got a warranty yeah. yeah 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 we're on the fencing side we're seeing more horizontal so you're right so since we use steel post we we're kind of limited in the materials we use for horizontal so, you know, when you're using these Postmaster posts, you have to go through the post into the material. Mm -hmm. So you can't use a fence picket, which is what you see a lot of guys that are doing horizontal builds. Well, they just use a six foot picket, turn it sideways, and then they cap it with a picket over, which is fine if you're going through the picket into the post. But when you reverse that, you can't go through the post into a picket. Um, so we use two by six, two by six eights. Um, which are more expensive. <laughs> Do you have the, the one by six by six corral boards there? Rough, rough cut for just full one inch boards. No, no, not, not too good. They're, they're 16 foot rails and okay. they are, I don't know what they cost nowadays. They used to be eight bucks. There's no telling what they cost now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Roughly the price of gold probably. Uh, yeah. So that's that we don't sell a, ton of horizontal only because it's you know roughly twice the cost of a privacy fence just because the materials yeah. that we use yeah. a two by six eight cedar is expensive but it's beautiful though it, oh it looks it looks great we did one uh, in chestnut western mm -hmm. red cedar in chestnut oh it looks so nice mandy's requesting pictures i, I can assure you <laughs> yeah we'll have to yeah we'll have to go back by there i'd like to do some because that was that was either early this year or late last year so it'd be neat to see i want to get more into that i want to get more yeah. into long-term long-term photography well, uh, in that, you'll find out where your weak points are yeah oh well, we're not spraying the tops good enough or, or oh we're not getting you know up next to the house though that's why i'm becoming a big advocate for you know a lot of people have uh, the industry has said wet the house down and then stain right up to the fence if it's a brick house or something like that and i'm a firm believer in in the cut in because i feel like that the long term effect of of the stain getting a little bit wet or things like that on the job site it's faster but I think two, three years down the road, we're going to see those spots. So we're trying to make a big change in our company this year to, 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 to start cutting every project in with a brush. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and here's the thing too, is we did a video, you know, a consumer facing video. It's like, what, what should you ask? How do you qualify a contractor? Right. What questions do you ask? What, documentation do you see? One of the thing is when you're asking for references, you ask for references, I usually recommend two new references that are within a year and then two that are older than five years so that you get a good feel for what's the fence going to look like the day it's done. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, what's it going to look like five years from now? Uh, and so that's kind of where my mind goes when we're talking about photography is what if you had, you, I think it would make a nice impact if you had a photo gallery, current projects, and mm -hmm. then, projects that are, I don't know what the wording would be, but five, five plus year old project. Yeah. You know, it'd be really neat if you had a couple galleries where you could see one year, two years, three years, four years and watch a fence in, in it as it ages. Yeah. Uh, it'd be really neat, especially for our business. Absolutely. I mean, it would take more legwork for sure. I mean, our, our workflow is, you know, when our crew is finished with a fence, part of their closeout checklist is they take the pictures of the fence. Right. So the follow-up pictures would be a little bit more legwork. You know, it would likely be, be what's that? Got to be on a corner lot of a main road where you can stop by anytime you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't go knock on the neighbor's door and be like, hey, can I get back into your backyard? I'd really like a picture of your neighbor's fence that we built. Um, yeah, but I don't know. It, I think that's interesting. You, well, and it, you know, it wouldn't be that hard, Caleb. So one of the things that you and I have talked about is, you know, maintenance schedules, selling mm -hmm. a recurring maintenance plan for a fence, um, you know, our model that that has worked well so far is a yearly cleaning, mm -hmm. and then with a you know with a maintenance coat three you know every three years or something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And then that would, that would really give you, I mean, obviously that gives you access to the yard every year. Uh, every you know, that's true. And, and also there's a whole nother job here that, that is photographer. You know, if you have somebody that takes pictures of your projects once a month, one day a month, go out and take pictures of old fences. Yeah. You drive by, you see an Ozark fence, snap a picture of it. And mm -hmm. There you go. So do you use a program called company cam? Uh, you know, we don't, I've heard of it lots of times, but we, we have just Facebook or not a Facebook of just a group chat that we, pictures they just go right yeah. in on them we pull them out and use them we use company cam and it would actually be it would actually be incredibly easy so company cam you have projects which are folders for the pictures mm -hmm. and they're by address like a geo located address but what's interesting is it has a feature where you can overlay a silhouette of an existing picture is is meant I know exactly what you're talking about yeah that's a great idea so it would actually make it easier if so even it, on the crew, geo targets so you don't have to input the data just when you take a picture at geo catches where where you're at yep, uh, yep. so and, and you can look at a map and see projects so that would be a thing like the crew like after their you know follow up you know, after their closeout checklist is done then before they leave, they open up the map to see if there's one in the neighborhood that they can swing by and take a picture of. I like the sounds of that. Those are pretty nice features. Mandy, if you're listening, maybe we yeah. can get that. Yeah, it's company cam. Um, so Sean, Mr. Fence, turned me on to company cam because they use it in their business. Uh, and he uses it at a whole new level. So they inventory all of their trucks, all the tools, all the serial numbers in company cam as well. So like, you know, set truck one has a has a project in there and then they just they document all of the tools and all of the serial numbers and then they they use the before and after picture feature to take year they do once a year the inventory on the truck i believe it's once a year but every time they inventory they take new pictures yeah uh, they, if they replace the tool it gets a new picture etc um so that they know exactly you know, what tools are on the truck. And they, the most important thing is for me is it documents the serial numbers. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, if you're, if you're running a wood crew, I know for a fact that I don't have access to the serial numbers on my nail guns right now. Yeah. Why do you have, why do you have the other trucks nail gun? <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, it's not, Absolutely. It's not that you don't entrust your people, but it, it no. definitely, when you walk into a pawn shop and you find three nail guns and you know they're yours. You well, that's, exactly. That's, that's exactly what's in my mind is, you know, God forbid our, our lot gets broken into overnight mm -hmm. and our truck gets ransacked and all the tools are taken. And, and the number one, the, you know, the first question they ask is, well, do you have serial numbers of your equipment? So we know what to look for. Yeah. No, no, no. But it's a DeWalt. Oh, okay. It's got my initial card. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, Mister Fences, they've been using company cam for years. So they start. So this is exactly where my mind. So they use it every single estimate. So they, and when they create the estimate, they create the project, uh, which is absolutely you started on pro, on day one. Uh, so you've already got it in there. Hey, Mr. Fence, Sean, do you do you do a uh, a presentation or anything? Do you send anything after the job is complete with that company cam before and after picture for your for your clients? Or is that just in house? I'd love to hear that answer. My the only limiting factor to the before and after in the company cam is it's all branded and it doesn't. The presentation of the before and after doesn't look great. Let Let me ask you this: What if I'm talking to Sean and Joe here? And even even anybody listening, what what if um, you have your picture of the house before before the fence is there, then the company cam the exact same angle shows the fence, and then you take that and you put it, you know, this I'm, I know this is getting in a gray area, but you tag the homeowner or you just ask them say, hey, we have a a little presentation, maybe it's one or two or three or four pictures on Facebook showing off your job can we tag you in it you tag them they share it on their facebook a year later what does facebook do it, it yeah. brings memory up your 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 memory last year and then it shares it again it could be something that gets your work before and after in front of 
all your customers' friends. And, and you, you want more customers like your customers, and generally they're friends with people like themselves. So maybe, uh, maybe so, you know, it's scary. It, it's scary, like how much of the same wavelength our minds are on. Yeah. Only because, so I had that thought about a year ago of, yeah, you, know, you tag the customer, hey, you know, Woodland Heights, here's a great new fence at the Williams family's house. The yeah. only problem is a company can't tag an individual. Yeah. Like, so Ozark Fence, I can't tag you in one of my pictures. You would have to get the homeowner to tag it. And But, Thank you know, you. I've seen some companies, like there's a power wash guy here in Nashville. And um, I, I think his name, I can't remember his name. Kelly Richardson will know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, he, he has a picture of himself smiling and his, he's got a sparkle in his teeth, you know, in the picture, but every job he does, he tags the homeowner, but it's on his per he's, he's running it as a personal page. Yeah. And, uh, he, he says, thank you, uh, Sean Williams for, for letting me do your project. It's beautiful now. And he's, if you go back through his page, he's tagged every customer he's ever worked with and it's hundreds. And I think it's a, a major factor to his success because when you're an individual, they can share it within those, HOA neighborhood groups and things. And I think he's keeping pretty busy by doing that. So here, here's Sean's follow. He has a few others that I'd like to talk about, but this is, I think the answer we can get the homeowner to post a folder of pictures because you can share in company cam. You can send someone like I could send you a folder of all I these pictures. Sometime. Send me a folder sometime. I'd like to see yeah. that. So I think that would be it. I would, I think that would be in the thank you. Mr. Williams, I really appreciate the opportunity, uh, you know, to provide you a lifetime fence, you know, whatever your verbiage is. Also, while on site, our guys, you know, took take their processes to take pictures before and after the project. We'd like to share those with you just for, you know, some of our customers think it's fun to see. Yeah. We'd like to share those with you. Uh, just, you know, and it, obviously work on the verbiage, but. As a courtesy, if you use it on Facebook, would you mind on social media? Would you mind tagging us? It would really mean a lot, or something like to that effect. Yeah, I think that uh, it yeah. may be worth a Starbucks card to somebody once a month or something. You know, give away. But yeah, I like it, and and I've thought of that for years and years because I've I've saw that guy that did the Facebook thing I mentioned, and I I thought how can I do that in the most professional and respectful, courteous way. And company cam may be a, may be yeah. an answer. I think Sean's on it here. I think you provide all of the picture documentation. I think this does a couple of things. My mind just does. So I think you provide them all to the homeowner and say, hey, here's the, here are all the pictures for your use. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you did tag us, it would mean the world to us, et cetera. I think it does another thing too, is it, is it provides a baseline of here's, here's how the project was left. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, you know, a lot of people Facebook lead. So if they come into you through your Facebook chat for your company mm -hmm. you and make a post as a company, and then you can share that post with the messenger, the person on messenger that you did business with. And uh, then it, they've automatically got the post and you could say something right there. And you could probably build a messenger bot to do that for you and say, hey, you know, it was a pleasure working with you. Please, it would mean the world to us if you would share these these beautiful photos before and after on your of your your fence. Yeah, so Facebook Messenger bots get a little bit gray area. You can get you can send them one. Was I afraid the verbiage for it? You can send them one unsolicited message, but you can't send them two. So without them responding, so it has to be a conversation. Yeah. To prevent companies from yeah, you do that, you that could be part of your job checklist too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, hundred um, percent. All right, let me. Sean takes us to another level too. So they take a picture of every hole before. So I wonder if that's before we dig. So that's that's a nice thought too, um, because my mind goes to you know overall project shots during the layout because um, I think what this does is it also provides some documentation if there's a utility damage. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mind goes to the customer that said, I said two inches over that way. And when you know, you know for a fact they said right here, here's the mark. Yeah, yep. covering your tail. Well, so Dan, Dan Blanc or Blanc said, um, he had a nice post a few, uh, maybe a week ago, um, that the customer said that his guys damaged their vehicle, that they dropped a two by four on it or something like that. And he actually had a photo 
before of before the project with that car in the photo with the damage. So he's like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you, this is something that I'm sure is probably easily overlooked. Yeah. You likely didn't realize it till you saw it. Uh, but here's a photo with a tape, date and time stamp that shows that car, the damage on that car before we even started the work. Yeah. Thank uh, God for that. Good job, Dan. Yeah. Could you imagine? And Dan used our mahogany stain at his house. Every time I think of him, I think about that fence. I, I use his pictures all the time. Mahogany's a great color. It's, oh, man. it's not here at the house, too. Um, yeah, so this is exactly where we send them a finished folder of the fence during the day and at the end so they can see progress from the work. They brag about to their coworkers. I like this so much. You know, Mr. Fence, he's really slacking, though, because he's not <laughs> built one chrome fence. <laughs> that I know of. He, yeah. made it, he has. Yeah. <laughs> I'm calling you out, Sean. Chrome fence. So uh, Sean turned me on to uh, orange chrome. <laughs> uh, so, and of course, it's right after I got uh, my most recent truck and trailer wrapped. But I asked, uh, I asked my wrap guy, I'm like, hey, uh, orange chrome is a thing when you're wrapping? He's like, uh, hold on and I'll check. He's like, you know what? It is a thing. Okay, well, go ahead and just put that in my project folder that from now on, orange chrome. You know, we've got, a, we, we, we've got sprinter vans and I've got, we do the same wrap on everything. And I've got another one out here that, that's ready to be wrapped, but I have stopped and I'm not, we're, I'm going to do a total new design just because of Mr. Fence. He's got my wheels turning. I got to up the game a little bit. He, see, this is the thing, right? We were talking about guys like Sean, like yeah. how they're improving, improving the level of the industry as a whole. Yeah, I'm thinking titanium or platinum or something like that. So yeah, that's good deal. So now everyone has a lot. Everyone has a bunch of homework to yeah. uh, go and figure out. Well, that's the thing. It's so easy to sit here and talk about this. The hard part is to to execute that. But the execution is what uh, is what you know pays. The, what is it they say? Skills pay the bills. You got to get out there and do this stuff. Yep. Well, that's the thing is is you have to implement. You know, it's not enough to have the idea. It's the implementation is the key. Uh, so Kenny said, one of my builders uses Builder Trend. You can share pics with the client, subs, update change orders. Still learning it, but so far it looks promising. Yeah. Um, you know, we use Job Nimbus and we, we upload, mm -hmm. Mandy uploads pictures in that all the time. You still yeah, so, Job Nimbus or did you swap out of that? Yeah, no, we're getting back into Job Nimbus. We left for a while um, just to... In search of greener pastures that did a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, they don't exist. They are not out there, and we're coming back into Job Nimbus now. Um, but Job Nimbus, uh, there's a uh, interaction. That's not the word. A integration with Company Cam. Ah, so you can integrate those. Sounds sounds so good. Yeah. So it's good. So uh, Sean says they can put their logo in it. Sean. Do you use the before and after feature of company camp? That's my only complaint. If I am to find a complaint, that's the only one is that the before and after looks clunky. You know, it's, it's got their logo in it. It just doesn't look great. I like, I looked and I, I couldn't see if you could change the before and after template. I'd like to know if you do that. Uh, all right. So Bo follows us as you could bundle it. We're implementing a policy where we reward the customer with a $5 Amazon card for their, Reviews at the job, you get offer. You could offer a five dollar gift card for sharing the folder and review. But here's a word of caution: is that violates terms of service uh, for both Google and Facebook. Um, you cannot financially incentivize the outcome of a review. Um, now, that's the rules. How do they find out? I don't know. But you know, do they find out? Probably not. But I would change it to a five dollar Starbucks card and um, go with that. People, yeah, I would five bucks on Amazon's nothing, but five bucks is a free cup of coffee yeah. from Starbucks, and everybody loves drinking free coffee from Starbucks. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think anyone would ever find out, but just like I said, word of caution, you, you find you cannot financially incentivize the outcome of a review on Facebook and Google for what it's worth. Yeah. Now, do people do it? Absolutely. So Amazon has the same policy in like almost everything I get from Amazon has something in there that's like Give us a good five star review. You know, you know what I would do. You know what I did, and a lot of guys are going to think I'm crazy for this, and maybe I am. Um, 
we offer a hundred dollars for a five star review and we off but we pay that one hundred dollars to our crew. Yeah. We we don't we don't pay the customer. Um and, yeah. and what has to happen is um what what happens is the is is my crews have taken ownership. It it no longer is the job they're going to do. Now it is their job. This is my job and I'm going to handle it in my hands here and make sure that everything goes perfect because if we do how if there's two or three guys on the crew, they get to split that hundred bucks. And at the end of the, I'm telling you, I paid out. I think um, I don't know enough money. I could buy a pretty nice truck this last quarter uh, in review money. But we're getting tons of reviews. My callbacks are down. Customers love it, and yeah. um, it 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 has really helped the morale in my company, and it has really helped our finished product. So I think you should offer the money to your crew because they're the ones that you're you know, without them, you're nothing. So um, five bucks is not going to do anything for the customer. But if you get that, your your crew out there, pay them a little money, they're going to take the time to, to uh, you know, put their arm around the customer and say, you know, it was a pleasure working for you. Is there anything else we can do? And yep. they're going to say, no, you know, it's, we love it. If you love it, would you be kind enough to leave us a five-star review? Yep. You don't do that. And that's what, that is within terms of service. Yeah, you know, because that's not a direct financial incentive for the customer to leave a good review. Um, so that would be that would be the way to do this within terms. Um, who was I was listening to? I was listening to a podcast. Uh, it's a guy that does garage doors. Man, I wish I remember his name. He does a ton of garage. Like he's taken over the United States garage door industry, um, and he does exactly what you're talking about. He incentivizes the technician, and he, it's like, um, it, but they have to use the technician by name. You know, just so he knows. Yeah. And eight years. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, and they train the technicians, right? They say, hey, during your, what, so what he does is five minutes prior to wrap up. So, you know, before the guys start cleaning up, they say, you know, Mr. Miss Customer, can I walk you through the project? Da, 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 da. All right. Is there anything here? Like, this is a great time. I haven't put my tools up yet. Is, is there anything you'd like to see done a little bit differently while I'm ready to go? No. Okay. So what, what I'm hearing, you know, and the customer gives you some feedback. So, okay. So what I'm hearing is this is a five-star level of service because five-star is our standard. Four-star for, whoop, if I don't knock my mic off the four-star for me is subpar. I need this to be five-star level of service. Would you agree that that's where we're at or, can, or what can I do to make it five-star? Because you're already, now you're kind of putting that in their brain. Yep. It's a five-star level of service. I love, thank you so much. I, that means the world to me that you see what I see because all of my work I see is five star. I'm glad you see it as five star as well. Do you know that our company actually runs a contest for reviews? Like I know it sounds crazy, but it would mean the world to me if you would share that five star opinion with other people. You know, we love to see them on Facebook or Google, that sort of thing. Yeah. If you did that, like I get special recognition for it and it would, I would love that. Yeah. That's that's exactly what we do, and that's it. And it works. It's it's very well because five dollars doesn't make any difference at all to your customer. But yeah. uh, you know, whatever I've tried different dollar amounts. The hundred dollars is a sweet spot. If you can give a hundred dollars for a review, man, you you talk about changing the lives of your employees because that's what we're in business for. You know, we're do you, not. Do you do hundred dollar bills? Yeah. 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 That's exactly where my mind went. Is hundred dollar is a bill, and that. I like that a lot. It's, yeah. it's that's and it's a presentation thing too. Yeah. Well, you got to take care of your people, and and, and now everybody says labor is so hard to find. Well, what you know, if you had a the best crew in town, could you make a hundred extra dollars on each job? Absolutely. No. You know? Absolutely. And is that review worth a hundred dollars? I would argue that review is worth significantly more than hundred dollars. Well, and that's the thing when when your team members are. are happy and they're doing a great job do you think you sleep better at night yep yeah, yeah man it's it's tough. it's tough when labor's short you know and you're worried about things so if well, you that's give it. it'll, it'll really help build your business how expensive is it to replace an employee very expensive yeah so if you can pay to retain that employee so i've heard i've heard the term used internal and external customers Mm -hmm. So your external customers are exactly what you think they are. Your all your clients outside that are paying you to do the service. Your internal customers are all your employees. You need to serve. You need to service them both with. You, you need to provide customer service to both. 
your yeah. internal and your external. Uh, I think that is absolutely the right way to look at it. Well, you know, without employees, without our team, I would be Chuck in a truck. That would be me. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is, and also, and also our team members are, they're better at what they do than I am. Oh man. Tell right? me. I employ people that, you know, that do better work than I do. Could I go build a fence? Yeah, absolutely. I could. But I found people that are even better than I am at building that fence. Yeah, certainly. So, yeah. You know, that's what, when you're scaling a business, that's what you do. You find someone that does that, whatever you're doing better than you do and you let them do it. Yeah, it's and that's painful for some people, but it's it's only painful until you go, oh, it's working. Look at that. That yep. how, how, I'm I'm a genius. I hired someone better than me to do what I'm not good at. <laughs> yeah. Well, and as entrepreneurs, like it's hard to think like that. The bit, yeah. Because you're always like, well, I can. The entrepreneur spirit is, well, I can do that better. Let me go do that. Yeah. So it's hard to think that there's someone out there that does it like even better than you. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. You're, you're devoted and committed to it and, and you'll do it. But is it really better? It's probably not, you know, it's no, uh, it's just your version of that. Yeah. All right. So uh, Sean was saying, or Mr. Fence said uh, they, so they document before they dig for locate disputes. I, I think that's absolutely the right way. So we, we need to implement this. <laughs> Our process is if there's a, if there is a damage that occurs, then we document that, you know, with a tape measure to the low, to the nearest located, you know, paint location, you know, and, but yeah, I think Sean's right. I think if you do it before you even start digging, it just adds that much more credibility to it. Yeah. I like, so I like this. So Mr. Fence says they can also do video with company cam. I like that a lot. So you could do a video walkthrough. Hey, Mr. And Ms. Smith, you know, uh, you weren't at home when we wrapping up the project. So I wanted to shoot you this quick video so that you, you know, you can see immediately, you know, how beautiful, you know, the beautiful fence that you're coming home to and share that out. I like that a lot. So check this out. We took over 15,000 photos on company cam last year and created 949 projects. Yeah. Well, and he now he's got this huge portfolio to go back on too. Right, that, that's documented. Now he's got all these folders. He can, for me, somebody calls and they say, "I want a picture of your eucalyptus stain," and I go, "Okay, I've got ten thousand pictures on my iPhone. We've got yeah. folders all over our computers." But that program there looks to me like it would be a real easy way to 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 class group things into into different places. So, the, one of the best selling tools for us for picking color is basically before and after pictures. Everybody wants yeah. a little piece of wood, you know, they're holding it up and they're saying, well, it's not what I thought. Well, here's here's a picture, you know, of, of you know, the chestnut and the pecan in, in multiple lighting conditions. Here's three or four pictures of each color. The pictures work so much better because you, well, kind of, you get the idea of what it's going to look like. And, and one thing they do too, especially a project specific picture is, I mean, you've seen this to where if you have 50 boards, you're going to have 50 shades of chestnut. Yeah. Just because every board's a little bit different, you know, coloration. I mean, not maybe not 50 shades, but you you know, you're going to have multiple boards that don't look exactly alike. Well, uh, well you can pull up, you you can say, you know, the fence over here on Elm Street, we stained it last year. It was it was in the same condition as yours and you want to do the same color. Let me show you the before and afters on that. Exactly. Well, because that's the question that comes up is when they're when someone asks for a referral or uh yeah, you know, they ask for you know, the, it's a word I, I the word is I'm looking for. They ask for ones in their area. Yeah. Right? And I see a few examples around me and how easy is it to pull up that map and go, Oh, you know what? We've got three in your neighborhood here. Let me, let me yeah. you know, send you the pictures or, or send you the addresses. A perfect time for a three minute zoom call to pull up that map and show them all the fences around them and, and show them what they look like. And yep. give them yep. the well, and that's the thing. And Hey, I absolutely encourage you to go look at them. But while I got you, let me just click through and show you what to expect when you get there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. But your fence is right that they're team members. Um, I think, I think as an industry as in general, we need to get away from employees um, because I think there's negative connotation around that word. Yeah. You know, I feel, I feel it. That's why I mentioned, you know, the, our employees are our team members. And I said yeah. that Yeah. Uh, because you're right. It does, uh, it, it makes it makes me feel like I put myself above them and where what I really do is I try to elevate them above me so bingo because it's so it's it's 
they're everything and um, they mean the world to me and my wife and our family. So, and I think other companies, I think what happens is everybody thinks that, that bosses and company owners are, are uh, wall street billionaires that, that would just want to turn people into slaves. And that's really not the case. That's so, that's such a far off thing for most people that, yeah. And we need to get people to realize that uh, teams just work together and make great things happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's no second home in the Bahamas, you know, you know, no vacation home in the Caribbean. Absolutely. So Sean says all of theirs are tagged by style, color, brand, and height. <clears throat> I like this so much. Yeah, I do too. yeah. I, so here, yeah, this, this is exactly what I was talking about when I said in the beginning that, you know, there's guys in our industry that are just elevating the whole thing. And Sean is doing that, you know, to an incredible extent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, Sean, and, and I dare to say that Sean would not have grown as much as he's grown if he kept it all to himself. Absolutely. Yeah, I, no, I, I agree. Yeah. So, um, so Sean's actually putting together a, like a training program, mm -hmm. an online training program. And I am so excited to see what that looks like. Sean, uh, I'm, 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 I'm personally putting myself at your service to add anything that you need to yeah. that for free. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. You know, that's, I can't imagine how much value is going to be cram packed into this thing. Mm -hmm. you know, we we've been chatting here for just a little bit on this one company cam. And now Sean's given me about 12 different things uh, that I need to go do Monday morning uh, on our company, you know, as we implement company cam into the pro into our company culture. Mm -hmm. Well guys, I tell you what, so it is, 521. Uh, we typically like to wrap this up at 530, especially because, you know, it's been, you know, two and a half hours since I've went and played with my new little one. I'd sure like to go do that again. Um, so we're going to wrap this up pretty close to 530. If you guys have any more questions, comments, etc., drop them in the comments below. Uh, here's the thing, too, is so after this is over, it will then be processed into a pre-recorded live in YouTube. And I say that to say, so if you're watching this as a recorded version, you can still drop comments in the comments below. We'll still see them. You know, if I can answer it, I certainly will. And if it's more of a Caleb question, I'll forward it to him. Uh, but if, just because you're not watching this live, if it's pre-recorded, don't think you can't leave a comment. Um, we'd sure like to help you however we can. Yeah, certainly. It's, it's a pleasure. Caleb, is there, is there anything we didn't cover? You know, I, I felt like yeah, we, we covered, you know, we covered so much and we covered so little, you know, let's, let's do this. Can you do, can you do a quick, you know, quick eight minute spiel on, uh, on fence armor? Cause that's another product I really like. Yeah, I, you know, you know, earlier, but I didn't get to talk about that. So, so fence armor is something we believe in it so much. We're actually going to make it a standard part of our proposal, uh, for 2021. We're already doing it. And, we believe in it. So when we stain a fence or you build a fence, um, what happens is a lot of times we'll be in the neighborhood. Um, when, when you stain a fence and it's brand new, it's a certain color. And after a couple of days, all of those pigments just really soak into the wood and the color changes just a hue. So when we're in a neighborhood and we come back a week or two weeks or a month later, we love to take pictures of the fence in its natural environment, if you will. What it looks like when the grass is all grown up around it and the landscaping's done. And the one thing we noticed was at the on our fence post at the bottom of the post, the, the weed eater was coming through and, or even the lawnmower and it was hitting and it was, it was, it was dinging up our fence. If you do a light color like pecan or a, a honey color, it's not a big deal. But if you're doing chocolate brown, man, you see that yellow bare skin through there. And so we found a fantastic company. It's called Fence Armor. Uh, and, and we're so proud to be with them. Al that I talked about earlier, um, all this stuff's made with there's one thing about the fence armor company is they're not going to make a product overseas. Everything they do is made out of American products, American steel, American screws, American finishing, American manufacturing, uh, North, everything in North America. And here, here's a piece. This one would match like our chocolate or sable brown stain, but this thing is just, you know, there's so many styles and sizes, but this thing slides right on the four by four post and it protects the post from a weed eater damage or, or lawn mowers. And this right here is about where the grass line is. And if you pick the right color to go with your stain, you never even notice these, but 
after four, five, six years, they still look great and you don't have any of that damage that cuts a post in half because the better job your lawn care company does, the harder it is on your fence. So that's fence armor. Um, galvanized steel, powder coated finish. This is a, look at that. I mean, yeah. you can't get much of a better match for the uh, for that pecan stain there. Right. And, um, but that's it. Comes galvanized black, white, tan, you name it, uh, vinyl fence. Uh, you can put it on aluminum fence, wood fence. There's even round post versions you can put on round post. And and we believe in this. I think it's a fantastic company and I think it's a fantastic product. So we use it and it's something that you could definitely add a value to your clients with. Yep. And so if if you're a if you're a do-it-yourselfer, if you're a homeowner and you don't have this on your fence, it may be a good idea. And if you're a fence company or a stain company, this is definitely something that's a low dollar amount that you could add on and really make a big difference. Not, you know, it looks great new, but five, six, seven years down the road, that's where you really see the improvement is uh, your posts are still nice and square instead of rounded off and look like a dog's been chewing on them. Yep. Well, so Caleb, here was, here's how, I'm sure there's going to be a day when wood post price levels come back down to reality and we start offering them in the future. Here's where what I was considering doing before we before we did away with wood post was so we always offered three levels of service. We offered value, improved value, lifetime value. Uh, the value being treated pine pickets, rails and posts, improved value being cedar pickets on pine rails and posts. And then lifetime value being cedar pickets, cedar rails, steel posts, which right now is, is our standard. That's, that's pretty much a lifetime fence. It really is. Yeah. So, it, right. My thinking is, or what we're what we're planning on doing is on the improved value. So you got cedar pickets. So you want a little bit nicer fence, but maybe you can't, you know, price wise, you can't get into the, you know, the higher level product. So cedar pickets, but then offering or not offering, just including fence armor, and post saver uh, because again yeah, yeah. Those products are an improved value yeah you should because even even your cheapest fence is still going to outlast the competition and these yeah. things i grew up building fence with my dad and you know when we would lay out a chain link fence and when and all the posts were up you just walk through with your box of fittings and you throw the fittings out on the ground or slide them down on the post as you walk through same thing one guy runs through he drops one of these at every post another guy comes behind him and it's it's literally one screw Right there, Zip one screw and you're done. You can, you can do two or 300 feet of fence in 10 or 15 minutes. And it's, I mean, it's that easy. It's super fast. Well, and again, it's another unique selling proposition, right? Because I guarantee your competitors it's aren't huge, offering that it's a huge, Yeah, it's a huge added value. If you, if you do the post saver sleeve, the post is protected from rotting. If you stain and seal it, the fence is going to be beautiful. It's less likely to warp and twist and it's going to look good for years on, on end. You yep. add this on it, and it's going to stay looking good. So, okay, did I hear you say that that had a 20-year warranty, the post saver, or did I mishear that? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. It says it right on here. There's a there's absolutely a 20-year guarantee on it. Nice. And uh, it's it's third-party tested at 20 years. 2020 was the 20th year we pulled it out of, of a, of a third-party testing, and there was zero rot. It wasn't that it, was, it lasts 20 years. It was at 20 years in the ground, there is zero rot on these posts. That means they're as good as new. And the main thing that a lot of people don't think about is they say, oh, our posts are treated. Well, treatment leaches out of post. Oh, right? yeah. When you put it in the ground, it gets warm or in, it's moist and, and it, it gets wet and dry, wet and dry. All that treatment leaches out. This stops that. So not only are, are you keeping moisture from getting into it, you're keeping the, the treatment process in there. And these are actually so eco-friendly that you can use them um, in organic wineries. You know, one of the big problems with organic wineries is they set the post in the ground and they can't use they can't use treated post. Yeah. And so every three or four years, they're just pulling the post out and replacing them. And, and these big wineries on the West Coast and up in Canada, hundreds of posts. And so this product right here took them from replacing posts every two to three years to one and done forever. Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's a couple of bucks, man. I mean, it's a couple of bucks. So well, eco link keeps, you know, it does, it does a great job. Well, and one thing we were talking job. about, I'm sorry, what was that? I said, as our president would say, a tremendous job, you know? <laughs> yeah. So one thing we were talking about last week is that treated pine standards or, or the treatment standards used in treated pine have really 
uh, they're not what they used to be. Well, is it a first shift post or a third shift post? Is it a Monday post? Is it a Friday post? Well, and not only that, but just the, the treatments that are used aren't what they used to be. No. You know, we're talking about CCA, yeah, yeah. pretty good stuff. Well, you can't use CCA anymore. Yeah. It has to be ACQ and MCQ are the two that are you know, readily available in our market. Mm -hmm. uh, but the trade-off there is they're not as efficient. You know, they're not as efficient as repelling the rot. So we get this question a lot when we're talking to customers because they say, well, my old fence it lasted 35 years. I just wanted to go back with that same treated pine. It's like, well, here's the thing is I can't go buy the treatment used in, in the fence that lasted you 30, 35 years. It's yeah. not available. You know, the treated pine that we're seeing in our market now, we replaced some last week that was installed six years ago and the posts are starting to rot. Yeah. So it, it, it's not it's bad. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, but it's, it's just the progression of our industry and we've just got to come together and find answers. And I think this is a great answer. Is this going to be here? Uh, is this going to be the answer in a hundred years from now? I don't think so. I think there'll be improvements, but this is an, an improvement. And a lot of people turn their nose up at this. Um, that's your loss. This is a great product. If you're yeah. doing as soon Caleb, as soon as we start offering wood posts, you and I are going to have a conversation, you know, personally on what it's like onboarding those, uh, because I see that I see that being paired with the fence armor as mm -hmm. being just a standard you know, standard of our improved value. You really should. You really should. And if you're a fence contractor watching this, you're going to see it because because this idea is really getting out. Where we people would they would be amazed to know how many of these we sold in the United States this year. I mean, it, it's a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were talking about Ruben Borg earlier. You know, when he and I were talking, you know, at your training, he he couldn't stop singing the praises of you know the post savers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. So, and that guy installs. A lot of fence. Yeah, 20 a day. Yeah. That's unreal. That's unreal. So, Caleb, one last question we had come in from Bo. Uh, what spray pressure do you recommend for oil-based stain in an airless sprayer? You know, we never look at a, at a pressure gauge, but my guys are running it at about halfway. And we're, where we're using uh, anything from like a 390 Graco, which is a like a beginner commercial machine. It's a commercial machine. It's an entry-level machine. Um halfway we're using a 1223 tip thanks to kenny dugan um which is it's a 24 it's like a 24 inch wide spray pattern but we hold it closer to the fence and so it's narrower but what we get is a reduced overspray and we can run a low pressure and but typically we're running these big gas powered machines so we can run two or three guns and uh I don't know what the, you know, there's no pressure gauge on them. We, I, I like things that are rudimentary. I don't want the digital stuff. So we just have a, a dial. You just turn the handle about halfway. Well, and I think there's a lot that goes into affecting the pressure too. You know, like you said, a different tip that mm -hmm. will, will affect the pressure you use anyway. Yeah. You want to get the most product out onto the fence with the least amount of overspray. That's what you're looking for. And that, that could be any pressure, you know, ideally the lowest pressure you can use and be efficient in my opinion is the best. Absolutely. Well, Most we did size up tip size. If cause, cause there's a lot of misinformation about airless sprayers. They say, Oh, you, you know, I can use low pressure. Um, in an airless sprayer, you got to do three passes. Well, yeah. If you know how to use an airless sprayer, I can, I can assure you, I can put on more product than any low pressure system, but you got to have the right setup. And it's, it doesn't cost any more money. It's actually the cheapest way to get into the stain business is an airless sprayer. 100%. Oh, that's how we got into it. It was a great code 395. So it's, uh, we like, and we still, those machines are workhorses. And and your the 395, doesn't that one have the uh, the digital readout on it? No, our, ours doesn't. Now, okay. so we bought ours two years ago though. So it might be that the current ones do, but ours doesn't. the 390, our, like our, I don't want to call it a backup machine, but it kind of is. If we're running a big gas machine, we'll have a 390 on the truck as a backup. And yep. uh, it's all all analog. I'm I'm an analog guy. I like the analog stuff. Yep. The less things that can go wrong, the better. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing you want to get is a check engine light on your airless sprayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it will happen in the middle of a job when you're, you know, an hour away from the shop. Like, it, it, yeah. that's when it will happen. Yeah, when you go out of town. So here, so Kenny answered the question as well, just high enough to get rid of the tailing on the spray pattern. Yeah. The tailing of the spray pattern basically is, is you have a thick spot on each end. As soon as that gets fanned out to where there's none of that, you're ready to roll. 
Bingo. Caleb, this, uh, we're going to start wrapping things up now because we're a little bit past 530. Let's wow. do this. I, I'd like to make this a regular, you know, monthly conversation with you. Uh, just where we, we sit here and roll on stain questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I guess that was a pun and I didn't even intend it, but uh, it's the, the Joe Everest podcast, man, it's the biggest, <laughs> the biggest fence podcast in the world. I, I'd like to bring as much education out into the world as we can. Um, one, so one thing that comes to mind that we can start with next time would be just spray nozzles in general. Uh, yeah, just we'll because there's, there's some technical details. That'll be fun. Well, and there's so many varieties of them, right? I mean, Graco has their at least two different, well, no, three different versions of their tips, at least three different versions of their tips. Um, you know, which ones do you prefer in, in all that? And, uh, you know, in the future, maybe we figure out a way again, I'm a fence guy learning technology here. Uh, but probably figure out a way to bring on guys like Kenny and just, you know, yeah. try to, what I would love to do is to try to provide a, a level of education, like what you did at the live on, on a larger scale. I agree with you, Joe. I think that's the future. I think that's what people need. Uh, like you said, a rising tide raises all ships. And, Absolutely. you know, if it wasn't for guys like Kenny, Dugan, Walt, Dennis, all these guys that are experts, yeah. Everybody always gave me flack for my name, stain and seal experts. And I thought, well, man, I, I surround myself with experts. Why can't I call it stain and seal experts? So yep. we, we have a lot of stain and seal experts out there nowadays. So I get the same thing. Uh, well, what makes you a fence expert? Well, you know, technically by definition, I guess we're both experts in our field. Our, yep. our PhDs, no, but, you know, we're learning. So Well, and that's the thing is, you know, it, it's all an experience. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, I have fence experience. I've been fencing since my dad could put a pair of pliers in my hand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's just years and years of experience. Well, uh, I think the thing that stands out most is when somebody walks over to you and does something different, you, you and I both kind of have the mentality of going, huh? Yeah. Look at that. Let's figure I, this I, out. I never, thought, I never thought about that. You know, that's a great idea. Well, and yeah, that's always the first thought. And the second thought is, I need to, I need to tell more people about this. Yeah. Can, can you tell me where you bought that at? Or where you're yeah. Right. You're right. I need to, I need to let everyone know. No, you know, Mark Olson and, uh, in his stuff that they're doing right now, uh, yeah. and Luke, what is it? Luke Gibson. Luke Gibson. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do they say? You know, we stole all this from other people and that everybody does that. We need to all bring our ideas together and, and create a melting pot. And it's going to, and I'll tell you what, it's going to raise the industry up. There just might be Chrome fences in a few years if we keep doing this stuff. Could be. Could be. I, and I think like, like, I think we'd all be better for it. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Joe, like, I, I, I did this without a charger and my MacBook is on 5%. <laughs> we timed it just right. Yeah. I appreciate you making time for us, Caleb. Thank I you, really, man, really, really glad to be here. Uh, guys. So if you do have questions or comments after this recording, leave them in the comments below. We'll be sure to uh, follow back up on that. If nothing else, uh, we'll plan this. We'll plan to do this again in about a month. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Caleb, thank you for your time. Fence fam out there, I appreciate your time. There's a 12 of you that have stuck it out with us, and I appreciate that a lot. Um, but yeah, for now, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, and reminding you that good fences make good neighbors. Good night. Have a great day.